Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh, folks. All right. Welcome back, people, to Mind Trap. All right. I'm just going to, first and foremost, I have to do a quick sound check and make sure the sound is coming through. I'm just going to bring up um, some of the comments. As you can see, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Somebody laughing. Yes, of course. See where where this mind trap has to take me just for you guys, people. I have to set up in my uh in my financial estate building over here. <laughs> no, I let me just check the sounds coming through fine. Um right, Muhammad Hassan, Ahlan wa Sahlan, Nabil Khan, uh Nora, okay, Shukran, Ahlan. People, let me just bring up the profile picture of um, who we have today, just right before you in the profile picture. Today's guest is Professor Leslie Terubeshi, uh, also known as Professor Abdul Karim, who is a, a teacher, a lecturer, um, a researcher on Islamic studies, Quranic studies, political science. He has uh, traveled throughout various countries, currently resides in Malaysia for several years, an author of over 60 books and a, has also, I believe, one to 200 research papers. Um, right, so without further ado, let me just bring up before us, Assalamu alaikum, Professor, ahlan wa sahlan. Ahlan wa sahlan, wa alaikum salam, brother. How are you, sir? I'm good. Shukran. First of all, I just want to thank you for taking the time out uh, for sharing really these valuable moments with us. We dearly appreciate it. Shukran. My pleasure. Thank you, Stu. Right. So I'm just going to, uh, just before we begin, I just want to make sure that people can hear, um, hear us both fine. There's no issues. Yep. I take it there's a, a confirmation there. Okay. So Professor um, Leslie, um, welcome to Mind Trap. And many people have have come across uh, various lectures or uh, research material that you've put out there. But for those who are coming to see you for the first time, let's guide them through a bit of your journey, if you will. Um, so you've starting with your personal journey and then we'll I'd like to go into some of the research material and and theses that you have out there but you yourself converted to Islam in the 80s is that uh, right? 1992 sorry sorry in in the, in the okay in the early 90s and and you yeah, guide us a bit through that so first of all what brought you to Islam and then a bit about your journey because you've traveled you've studied, you've lectured, you've ended up in Malaysia for several years and you're researching. So it's a <laughs> wow. So through uh, quite briefly, if you like, but navigate us through a bit of your life and the chapters. Yes, thank you, brother. Uh, um, yes, um, may Allah guide us only to say which is pleasing to him and my, may Allah guide us not to say anything that is not pleasing to him. So thank you, Brother Mufti, for having me on your famous show. And you are definitely very popular, I know, on, on YouTube. And I hope you <laughs> continue to do the great work that you are doing. Uh, so yeah, all feasibility lies, people say. So, yeah, actually what, what brought me to Islam, I can say that, well, it was my wife, as it were, you know, and I don't make any uh, excuses for this. I actually first converted to Islam because of this pragmatic reason. I wanted to marry my wife and I, I knew that she would. I had to convert to Islam before I want before I can marry my wife, because that's what Islamic law said. Muslims are not supposed to marry non-Muslims. See, the power, so, the power of love. See what it yeah, does. Exactly. It, yeah, guides, of, it guides yeah. people. Yeah, the little haq. It brings people to the <laughs> exactly. So Allah Taala has blessed me with an excellent wife. We have one daughter. She's living in Canada right now in Toronto. And uh, yes, yeah, so I became Muslim, and then we uh, returned back to this happened in Canada. We returned back to Malaysia. I went to work in a, in an Islamic college, which uh, now has become a university. Uh, that was Sunway uh, College. Now it is called Sunway University in Malaysia, and I stayed there for a number of years. 
And um, I have to also perhaps mention that, yes, initially my conversion, uh, as I mentioned, was perfunctory. But um, And I went on in this manner for a number of years, maybe six or seven years. And then I hit what I call my rough patch. Things became a little bit harder for me. And I realized one reason for my difficulties was the fact that I wasn't taking my dean seriously enough. So I had a kind of second conversion, if you like. Perhaps in the first one, I simply became a Muslim. While in the second one, I became a, a mukmin. I began to read the Quran every day. Yes, thank you. And also to pray the five daily prayers and, and whatnot. And uh, also began to go for the Friday prayers in, in uh, you know, know, uh, Malaysia. So that's how it got started. And um, after five years in, uh, you know, at, at this college, uh, we uh, went back again briefly to Canada for a year uh, or so. And then once again, as I mentioned uh, earlier in our pre-recorded talk, uh, I uh, again began to feel uh, a little bit like a fish out of water, so we, we returned to Malaysia once again. And I resumed my job at the previous college. I stayed there for three years. And then uh, I, how do I put this? I think I said something in my classroom that upset some of the people. Uh, you know, I, I, we had a discussion. The, the, yeah. It happens to the best of us. <laughs> yeah. So well, what happened, we were discussing because, you know, I, I am a fairly free ranging type of uh, teacher. Sometimes I think we can we have to progress by digressing. That is also a form of progress. So we, we began to talk a little bit about other religions like, uh, you know, Hinduism and whatnot. And I, I made, made a comment, something to the effect that, uh, you know, that uh, we should not even look as if we are praying to, to idols because somebody in the class alerted me that, well, you know, we... We Hindus actually don't pray to these images, uh, but because they're just representations, and we actually really pray to the one, you know, God that these images represent. Mm. So I kind of thought about it for a while, and then I said, well, I don't think that we should even do that, you know. And at the moment I said that, the classroom just fell silent. You could hear a pin drop. So I'm thinking, oops, did I say something wrong? Mm -hmm. Anyway, a little bit uh, later, a day or two later, my boss calls me into his office and he says, uh, he was from Canada, Leslie, I hear that you are making statements, inflammatory statements of a political and religious nature in, in your class. Mm -hmm. I said, really? So I said, uh, Terry, can you give me any evidence of such statements? And he, and he gave a very interesting answer. Now, remember, this is coming from a Canadian, you know. And in Canada, I'm sure in the UK, in the Western world generally, normally you expect evidence before you come to any conclusion. And you know what he said? He said, oh, come on, Leslie, we are not into evidence here. It is the perception that counts. Yeah. I was wow. shocked. <laughs> wow. I, I, <laughs> I almost felt like saying, Terry, do you think you might have been stayed in Asia too long? No, I'm sorry. Maybe I shouldn't be saying that. <laughs> but, but, you know, the, the whole regard for due process. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, basically he wanted to fire me on the spot. So I said to him, Terry, at least let me finish the term, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's what happened. I, I finished the term, but he didn't renew my contract. So wow. then I was going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and your ethnicity, you're of uh, diverse mixed heritage. Eastern European, yeah. I believe. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was born in uh, uh, Bratislava, Czechoslovakia. Now it's a separate country called Slovakia, about 5 million people. It is surrounded by uh, Ukraine uh, on the one side, uh, on the north, by Poland, uh, Germany, and Austria and Hungary. So it's a landlocked mm -hmm. country. It is distinguished by having the highest number of medieval castles in Europe. So if you like to wow. see medieval okay. castles, that might be the place to go. So... Yeah, I, I grew up there, and when I turned 16, my, my uh, uh, but to come back to my, my uh, heritage, my grandfather was Hungarian, my grandmother was uh, Austrian, and I still remember how she described to me how they got to know each other. They were at a skating rink, you know, in the old days, and they used to play music, classical music, and people would dance, you know, or using the skates. So my grandfather came, uh, came to her and said to her, young lady, may I please have this dance? And she said, young man, you may. So, <laughs> so they began I love the adab, the kind of the courtesy. <laughs> yeah, I know. So that's how it started. You know, and as you know, wow. 
we, we had the Austro-Hungarian Empire until World War I, so they were a kind of a marriage of Austria and Hungary uh, in my family as well. Luckily, uh, uh, the marriage lasted, uh, unlike the empire fell apart, but their marriage lasted. So that was on my father's side. On my mother's side, her ancestors, she told me, came from uh, France, and both of her parents were music teachers, uh, piano teachers, and on my grandfather's side, my grandfather was uh, a judge. He used to play the violin. Uh, in fact, he had a very expensive violin, an original Stradivarius, which I was supposed to inherit, by the way. And I checked the price of a second-hand Stradivarius, and I discovered it's worth about 17 or 18 million US dollars. That's for oh, a second. Wow. I know. Tell so, me you inherited it. <laughs> yeah, well, I was hoping to inherit it. Tell me you inherited it, and we'll cancel the show right now, and I'll just fly out to Malaysia, and we'll just... <laughs> have a party. Yeah, no, uh, what happened is my uh, my mom told me that one of my relatives, I think I have some suspicion, but Allah tells us not to be too suspicious. One of my relatives said, oh, uh, Leslie doesn't play the violin, so he won't need this. So they withheld it from me, and I there goes my 17 or $18 million, you know. But anyway, actually, I have to confess, Allah gave me something better than a violin or 17 or $18 Allah. million. Dollars. Islam, guidance, Huda. So I'm thankful for that. Thank you very much. Allah, Allah, Allah. 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 Professor, you've got, uh, what is it, uh, between, is it over 100 or 200 paper, research papers on re research gate, is it? Is that correct? Yeah, it's uh, slightly over 200, including about a dozen books. They are on the research gate under my Muslim name, which is Abdul Karim Abdullah. And they had about garnered about 160,000 views. On academia, you can basically find the same uh, portfolio of papers and books, but they are uh, registered there under my legal name, which is Leslie Teravesi. Yeah. Sure. And on Amazon, you've got uh, 60 plus books. Available. Yeah, on Amazon yeah. I have about 62 titles, I think, both uh, Kindle or ebook format and paperback format. The longer books tend to be in the paperback format only, but the shorter books are both in uh, ebook format and um, uh, in some cases also in the paperback format, if, if the book is long enough to merit a paperback. Wow, that's quite an accomplishment. Wow, you know what, well, God bless you. That is definitely, you know, for just hearing that from a distance sounds like, wow, what an accomplishment. MashaAllah. Some of your key titles, the, the major books that you've got, uh, one of them focuses on, um, it's, a, it's a critique of Western philosophy. Correct. That correct. And that one is called Islam in the West. And that came out of uh, an idea I had one time to write a paper with my, one of my co-workers on the issue, but he didn't uh, sound very enthusiastic. So I ended up writing it myself. In fact, that paper, that book uh, was partly a result of an effort, uh, an attempt I made to, to obtain a scholarship at Harvard University which I applied for. And I wanted to actually do research on that book there, right there at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And uh, so before they informed me, actually I uh, didn't succeed in getting a scholarship, but what happened in the meantime is that I, in the expectation that they would accept me, I worked very hard on the book. And so the, by the time I heard from them that they were not interested in supporting my research, I pretty much had a finished book uh, in front of me. So f for that purpose, for motivating me to, to bring it up to a higher standard, the, the, wow. the, the uh, you know, even though my expectation was, you know, didn't, it wasn't fulfilled, I at least managed to get a fairly decent draft. And uh, then, so I worked on it a bit longer and I developed a critique of the entire Western philosophical tradition, which I studied basically at the university under uh, the the friends of Leo Strauss. I'm not sure whether you have heard of uh, the so-called Straussians. They yes. are now a very powerful, I think, uh, one of the leading, perhaps the leading academic stream in, in uh, U the United States. Some people accuse them, I think somewhat unfairly, of being uh, quote-unquote neocons and all that, and even trying to blame them for what happened on 9-11. Barbara Honegger has a video on YouTube where she blames uh, the Straussians, uh, Leo Strauss in particular for this. But I think that is an unfair, uh, you know, uh, charge. I, and in fact, I wrote one of my papers, I, 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 I even wrote a paper about that, saying that uh, he would have never agreed uh, or, uh, you know, to this kind of, um, because I don't know what your views are about 9-11, but there's a group called the Truthers, 
who say that this was uh, okay. Uh, I hope this is not too controversial for your show, but they say that 9 uh, 11 was an inside job. Yeah, and uh, mm -hmm. so Barbara Honegger takes that view, uh, and she was a close assistant to two presidents uh, of, of the U.S. Ray, Reagan and Bush, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, she blames Strauss in particular for this th the kind of thinking that made this possible. But I, I take mm -hmm. issue with it. I don't think they should be blamed for that. It, it didn't come from uh, Leo Strauss. He would have never approved of that. And if you want proof, just read his book on Machiavelli, where the very first sentence uh, says that uh, I paraphrase roughly, but as close as possible to the original, he says, quote, we shall not surprise uh, anyone uh, if we incline ourselves to, uh, if we profess ourselves to be inclined to the traditional view according to which Machiavelli was a teacher of evil. Okay, so now he he rejects any kind of Machiavellism. You know, sure. the, politics has to be ethical. That is one of his basic messages, and I totally agree with that. Right. Yeah, I mean, and you've got another book as well on finance and Islamic finance. But before coming to that, I would like to slightly uh, i mean another major book sorry you've got obviously many books but a major book but before coming to that just to unpack a bit of this um a critique of western philosophy when you say that what 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 is it that you're critiquing about western philosophy in general to get an idea and the gist of of your arguments here yeah, what I'm critiquing basically is that uh, Western rationalism went too far mm -hmm. uh, to the point where it, as it were, threw out the baby with the bathwater. And the baby here is revelation. The bathwater uh, bath, uh, are the additions that were added uh, to the teaching of Isa alayhi salam and to the teaching of the Old Testament that distorted and, and corrupted our knowledge of the uh, uh, spiritual heritage of the Western world. So what we need to do is actually to recover the original original teaching of uh, Isa alayhi salam and also the original teaching of uh, the, the Old Testament, the Torah. And there are people who have already attempted to do uh, do this in the Western uh, uh, philosophical tradition. Hegel, George Friedrich Hegel, mm. the well-known German philosopher who wrote two books on history, by the way, alone. One was called The Philosophy of History. The other one is called The uh, History of Philosophy. But he also wrote in his early years a very interesting paper, a, a small book called The Positivity of the Christian religion and this one it can be found online and in it he basically attempts to separate the original teaching of Jesus from its positive elements from what he called its positive elements which are elements which were added on subsequently and were not part of the original teaching of Isa al Islam. Hegel by the way wanted to be a, an Ustad he wanted to be a people's teacher in German it's called Volkserzieher but we have, yeah, folks are here, <laughs> like folks, like again, folks are here. But anyway, uh, on the Jew, uh, Jewish, uh, for Judaism, we have the work of Benedict Spinoza, who wrote a yeah. book, who was a Jewish fellow, and he wrote a book which got him into trouble with his Jewish community. He was excommunicated by. Yeah, exactly. And so he became, yeah. turned, uh, converted to Christianity as a response, uh, I understand. But that book is called The Theological Political Treatise. And in fact, Leo Strauss's first book was on that. It was called uh, Spinoza's Critique of Religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I certainly highly recommend reading Spinoza's book. He writes very clearly, it's very lucid, and he, he makes some certain points which, according to you know the, the mainstream understanding in uh, Western philosophy, Spinoza's significance is that he wrote one of the first critiques of a revealed text like the Old Testament in the Western tradition from a rational point of view. And Hegel gave him a lot of credit for that. And in fact, Hegel continued that effort himself in his investigation of the teaching of Isa alayhi salam. So, yeah, what uh, Spinoza did, he pointed out, for example, some inconsistencies in the Old Testament, like certain numbers didn't add up. So in other words, he was saying that, well, you cannot take it literally. There are certain issues that, that we need to address. And I, I understand there were others who were uh, addressing this issue, like Maimonides also wrote a book called uh, Guide for the Perplexed. And I think if I understand it correctly, he was trying to deal with similar, similar issues when, when people begin to notice that, hey, something doesn't add up here. So how do we explain this? So my critique of the Western thought is basically that it went too far in the direction of uh, rationalism and neglected the significance uh, of revelation. And uh, therefore, and what this basically did was it liberated a lot of the passions, you see. Quran talks about uh, do not follow your desires. But when you look more closely at Western philosophy, what you see is their progress, a process of liberation of 
can I say desires? Abdon Smith uh, wrote about greed. He said greed is good, basically. Mm. We can, uh, you know, if we accumulate wealth for ourselves, we are doing something good for the community. Freud yeah. said it's okay to have sex outside of marriage and whatnot. So he liberated uh, the, the desire for pleasure. You know, we had we had others, the power. Thomas Hobbes uh, liberated. Uh, he said we are all uh, seeking power after power, you know. And so Hegel said we are all looking for recognition or fame or glory, you know. So all of yeah. these Every single uh, 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 Schopenhauer also, uh, you know, wrote, uh, you know, along similar lines. Nietzsche wrote about what uh, the will to power, you know, yeah. and uh, this had, mm -hmm. yeah, and this was this had tremendously damaging effect effects on uh, Europe, Europe and the world, because I believe that uh, uh, Nietzsche's philosophy, despite his brilliance, and don't get me wrong, I also mm -hmm. enjoy reading Nietzsche, but I think he got some things terribly wrong, you know, and yeah. and, by, uh, and Marx also, who claims religion uh, is the uh, opium of the masses, and then Nietzsche with his will to power, he was an mm -hmm. idol for the Nazis, by the way. Yeah. Uh, he's kind of, he's Obermensch, kind of the Superman character that, that yeah. he's kind of purporting. Yeah, and, yeah. and the German filmmaker Lenny Riefenstahl, made a film which is a, considered a classic by uh, cinema buffs called uh, The Triumph of the Will which is another celebration yeah Schopenhauer talked about will you know the will to live and Nietzsche took it a step further and Nietzsche there, considered... wasn't Schopenhauer kind of then grappling with nihilism and oh, yeah. and because he's kind of obviously got well you've got rid of God from the equation and then well what is the and I guess Nietzsche is trying to kind of provide some kind of an answer with this. Well, there's a you know the, the amor fati that this this will to fate that they, that you just have to play out just being you. Just you know, he's he's trying to say, well, just get on with it, and um, you know, it, it doesn't it shouldn't result in this kind of downward nihilistic approach. Um, did, one of the things he did, which I feel was a bit of an eye opener for for many people, was his genealogy of morals, because he's he's kind of put it on his head, hasn't he? And he's saying, well, hmm, you know, you think, well, these morals have come from from being good. Well, actually, it's an inverse. You know, it's like what the the have nots have kind of demonized <laughs> the actions of Perhaps, the yes. people who have. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, sort of like Marxist thinking, but uh, yeah. I would be careful with Nietzsche. You know, he writes yeah. some uh, some really. Uh, when he look at his will to power, what he says about fasting is just so incredibly ignorant. Uh, what well, does he well, say? He says it's a disease, you know, that uh, it's totally crazy to to fast. It's, there's no good reason for fasting. So obviously he never experienced the benefits of fasting. I remember one time, uh, that was before I became a Muslim. Mm -hmm. I fasted not because I wanted, but because I had the sore throat, which was so bad that I couldn't swallow anything for two days. So, or almost two days. So I fasted and I realized towards the end of this, uh, you know, period that suddenly my mind became incredibly clear. And I remember having a discussion with someone and the thoughts just came so lucidly. And I was amazed. I said, my goodness, uh, this is excellent. I have to try this again <laughs> or something along those lines. So I think uh, Nietzsche really did not understand, uh, you know, uh, religion or deen or faith uh, very deeply. There is a certain shallowness about him, and I th think this is one example of it. And as you know, he went crazy towards the end yeah. of his life, and for ten years he was basically a, a kind of a zombie or a yeah, vegetable. like an invalid almost. And and it's ironic yeah. because he he says what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but uh, it's almost an irony that it clearly, I mean, his debilitated state for the last ten or so years of his life. Um, yeah. So I see. So did you, so following on from that and looking at Hegel and, uh, I mean, Hegel, speaking of his kind of dialectics, uh, how did you see that? Because him trying to say, well, a kind of environment, uh, a social environment brings about its antithesis, which then results in, so this whole, um, did you, sh did you put some thoughts on that as well? Yeah, by the way, I can recommend a book by Alexander Korjev. He was a friend of Strauss, by the way. Uh, that's K-O-J-E-V-E. -E. He has a little book on the market called uh, Introduction to the uh, Thought of Hegel. 
and uh, or the uh, lectures on the philosophy of Hegel, and uh, they are so well written that I even said to a couple of friends, you know, I think I read both Hegel and, and Kojev, uh, but uh, in English, admittedly. But I told my friends, you know, I think the Kojev actually explains Hegel better than Hegel, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was so- that reminds me of uh, Charlie Chaplin attending a Charlie Chaplin lookalike contest and losing. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it was something like that because I guess Hegel was still struggling with it, and it happens to me all the time. That perhaps it partly is the reason why I have kind of I keep churning out these books one after the other because every time I finish one book, I say to myself, "Yeah, I'm not bad, but come on, I, I, I there's some I got to do better than that." So here I, I go I again. I admire Let's... your wow, your perseverance and and the energy you have. That's amazing. Well. Yeah, it's a kind of it's it's not that I actually want to do it. I almost feel like a need to do it. You know, I, I told my friends, for me, writing is not something that I, I normally write when when I hear something. Like I heard Brother Hamza Yusuf say recently in one of his YouTube videos that a mutawatir hadith is equal to the Quranic verse. I said, my God, how can he say that? Mm-hmm. Hadith, whether mutawatir or not, is still the word of human beings. How can it ever be equal to? the Quran. So bingo, yeah. straight away I sat down and began to write this paper. I think I even did a YouTube video. But to come back to your question, yeah. Hegel became important to me, you see, because even though I was associated with the Straussians for a number of years, yeah. and they are all very articulate people. They are graduates of the Ivy League schools in uh, Harvard. Uh, and they taught at uh, Princeton, Yale and whatnot. Very articulate people and, and very capable. But one thing that continued to, to, to uh, bother me or to somehow trouble me was this uh, dichotomy that I felt they were uh, building or uh, assuming between reason and revelation. You see, the the underlying assumption in their work is, as in quite a bit of other Western philosophy, is that there's this tension between reason and revelation, a tension between Athens and Jerusalem, as they like to put it. You know, that that some kind of a conflict that these cannot be reconciled. In other words, you cannot be a thinker and a believer at the same time. And I had difficulty with that. And as you know, probably you will agree, the Quran doesn't teach that there is any conflict between reason and revelation. Allah, Allah is the most rational of, uh, of all beings. In fact, you cannot to anyone so so he's the knowledgeable hakim and wise you know alim and hakim so i had trouble with that and i i think i maybe uh, mentioned it to one of my friends and he said oh yeah but if that's if that's how you feel about it you should read hegel because he doesn't believe in that i said what okay i'll have a look so i began to look into the work of hegel and indeed i realized that he tried to reconcile this alleged tension between reason and revelation how well he succeeded is of course open to debate there's a book written by one of uh, alan bloom's friends his name uh, is emil uh, uh, fackenheim he was a professor of philosophy at the university of toronto and the book is called the religious dimension in hegel's thought uh, it's worth reading i re- certainly recommend in the book and his assessment of Hegel's attempt to reconcile reason and revelation was that well he tried but he didn't quite succeed that may well have been a fair assessment but who can succeed this is not yeah. an easy topic it's a very it's... difficult task I mean trying to reconcile yeah. the two and and you have to consider as well the times are not the times in which these people are writing are not as modern as today um, you know people there's still restrictions and limitations and yeah, but um, are there any other names from that succession of philosophers that really st- stood out for you? Heidegger, Derrida, any 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 other, um, or or maybe before that that you thought uh, Leibniz maybe, or was there any anyone else that you thought was well, definitely remarkable? I th- was a fan of Rousseau. Still, I still mm-hmm. am to some extent. But even yeah, he, there are some issues with him. You know, I'm one of my. I wrote a paper in a philosophy course as an undergraduate on him on the question whether he was a democrat or an authoritarian. And I think in that paper I was leaning to the uh, view that he was a democrat. But later in my life I begin to lean to the other, you know, uh, you know, uh, view that he was something of an authoritarian. And I base my uh, conclusion on a famous statement that he made, I think, in a social contract where he said. That that. And by the way, this statement was plagiarized by Mao Zedong almost verbatim in one of his papers, which I discovered totally by accident. But the statement was that, I quote, if the people don't want to be free, they have to be forced to be free. End of quote. Mm. Now, compare this statement with... It's a very complex statement, though. Wow. But, but 
but compare the statement, brother, with what Allah says in the Quran, yeah. uh, Surah Al Baqarah, verse 256. La ikraha fi din. There's no force or compulsion in religion. Right. Okay. So, yeah. who is the authoritarian here? Yeah, I mean, is it the, uh, you know, uh, proponents of rash Euro European rationalism, the age of reason, the enlightenment, which resulted to some, to, uh, was responsible to some extent for the reign of terror. Remember yeah. the French Revolution, Absolutely. 1792, when 16,000 people, supporters of tradition of the monarchy, were put to death at the guillotine yeah. exactly. for the crime of supporting the king, for, for the crime of, you know, being traditional by the rationalists. So. Yeah. And then, by the way, think of what happened a thousand years earlier in Muslim history, when, according to Suyuti, 5,000 philosophers, in other words, thinkers or rationalists, if you want to call it that, but he uses the word philosophers, were put to death by Musa al-Hadi in 786 for the crime, are you ready for this? Of okay. thinking. Thinking. Their crime wow. was that they were thinkers. Put to death by Musa al Hadi. Musa al Hadi was the older al brother of, uh, of uh, you know, this uh, Harun al Rashid yeah. in 786. That was uh, part of the persecution of the rationalists, and uh, it was you, a blow. Do you Go really. Ahead. How many thousand did you say? 5,000. And, brother, 5, by the way, uh, uh, Afghani admits that this may have been an exaggerated yeah, number. Because, I mean, I. Because I didn't know. Yeah. Hmm. But I, I would have he, thought that that says, sounds a yeah. bit. Um, I know, it sounds a bit mm. high, correct. I mean, but, <laughs> it sounds a bit dist distorted because if we're going back to Al Hadi's time, and um, I suppose they, they're trying to lay, you know, the, the Abbasids have come into power. It's not been so long. Um, there's been bloodshed. They've kind of overtaken the Umayyads. Uh, naturally, there's going to be some sectarian thing in the year between Shia, Sunnah um because the abbasids have kind of snatched the throne and well where does that leave the the alul bayt because they rose on the back of them um and you can see that there is this uh kind of greek thing coming in it is coming in as it as it kind of starts to blossom more in Harun al-rashid's time and Mahmoud's time the whole dar al-hikmah and the translation kind of process by many of the muslim philosophers but does it really, I don't know, why would Al-Hadi use that time to turn against philosophers? I mean, this wouldn't, why, what? You see, they were, they were accused, okay, let me make it, uh, add another word to it. They were accused of free thinking. In other words, they were accused of being Zindiks or Zandaka, the, the free thinkers. And uh, there may have been other, you know, issues, like maybe they were plotting to overthrow the government, mm. I don't know, or maybe they were perceived as such. You see, because but, it would make sense to me, for example... Um, let's say, this is, I'm kind of trying to make some sense of this, um, uh, you know, objective kind of thought in the sense that I'm just trying to do detective work here, that let he has, obviously the Abbasids rise on the back of the Shia um, kind of movement from Khurasan and come down, and they overthrow the Umayyads. Now, many of the, the Shia tradition much of the Shia tradition is also rooted um, theologically, on, I mean, not theological, but from its usul fit perspective in reason. And they share with the Mu'tazila as well, uh, especially with later generations. Now, when the Abbasids take over, their immediate threat, obviously, once they extinguish the Umayyah, Bani Umayyah, is actually the Alawiyin, because in many ways, they are more deserving of this throne because th that's the cl that's the kind of da'wah that they usurp the throne on. So it would make sense that if they were to target and persecute someone from a political perspective, Machiavellian, looking at it from a kind of Machiavellian perspective, they would target them. And maybe a, a pretext, because what, why are you persecuting let's say, the family of the uh, the, uh, the Alawiyin or the Hashmiyin, uh, it doesn't make sense. Like, you can't justify that to the public. So to justify that by, well, they're actually Zindiks and coat it with a different lens because um, whereas really the issue is political, that I, I'm, I don't know, that sounds very, like, real, the kind of things that real leaders and rulers and these kind of people, dynasts, have been doing. 
No, absolutely. In fact, uh, Al Afghani. Uh, but by the way, the five thousand number was quoted by was written by Soyuti. So Al Afghani was only quoting that number that was given by Soyuti five hundred years earlier. Mm -hmm. So, but he added that yes, it was probably exaggerated. But he adds that there's no doubt that it happened. But maybe to a lesser extent. But still, he calls it a blot on Muslim history. But what I would like to highlight here is that this conflict between uh, reason on the one hand yeah. and tradition on the other hand in the Muslim world was uh, resolved in favor of tradition and some mm. rationalists were killed in the process. So yeah. in a sense, orthodoxy to some extent was enforced through by force basically yeah. to some extent. Okay, And what happened in Europe, something very similar. Uh, rationalism was also enforced by through a, was imposed by force, the so-called reign of terror. And here we know that about 16,000 traditional people or supporters of tradition of the monarchy were killed in this attempt to impose rationalism on the rest of re, uh, Europe, or at least France. Uh, you know the the age of reason, the enlightenment, and whatnot. So that is, so in other words, they tried to solve the problem, but. In Europe, it was reason that emerged victorious, but in the Muslim world, it was tradition which emerged victorious. And we are still living with that until today. Yeah. I mean, let's unpack that a bit, because this is such a big crux, isn't it? And this is such a big issue uh, that people present. Uh, I think at, at times it's just a, to me, it's on many occasions a false dichotomy that's kind of where people are being made to choose something which really at the heart of Islam was never uh, a thing. Like they've made it a thing. It's like a while back in the UK, not so much now, but a good few years back, there was this thing that, oh, are you Muslim first or are you British first? You know, there was this kind of, the media was hurling these kind of questions around. And 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 many people were saying, well, look, this is like a false dichotomy. You know, you can't, it's not, we, you know, we are British and we are Muslim. There's not a, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to make it sound like there's a false dichotomy here or there's a choice, a binary here. And yeah, so in many ways, this thing of saying to people, well, is it aql or is it naql? So... Yeah, let's uh, yeah, let's let's unpack that a bit because I think it's so important. No, it is important, and you are right. In fact, when I joined the university, uh, the Islamic Science University of Malaysia here in two thousand and two, where I stayed for five years, one of their uh, part of their mission statement was to uh, arrive at a suitable reconciliation or harmonization of akl and nakl. And I think that is the right way to proceed. There should be harmony here. And I agree with you that the so-called tension between reason and revelation, or reason and tradition, is a false dichotomy. I totally agree. In in fact, my very last paper that I wrote at the Institute and which went through, by the way, approximately 700 revisions, it was the most revised paper I ever wrote, uh, was titled uh, Harmonizing Reason and Revelation in Education. I was grappling precisely with this issue, you know, and I concluded, this is the point I'm trying to make, that n there is no tension between uh, reason and revelation. You can be a believer in Allah in the last day and you can be also a thoughtful person at the same time. You don't have to shut Shut down your reason or shut down your brain to be a good Muslim. No, actually, I have, I think you have to open your brain yeah. and, uh, you know, engage with the signs of Allah, which come, of course, in the form of the Quran, but also in the world of nature. They also constitute uh, the, the book, the second book of Allah, as we say. So uh, to be a good a, a Muslim, I think we need to use our akal. And when we reduce our reliance on akal, we run the risk of letting tradition go too far, just like the Europeans allowed the reason to go to too far, and look what happened: two major wars in uh, world wars in Europe, persecution of minorities. Yeah. So, of course, things didn't get that bad uh, in a in a Muslim world, but mm -hmm. we do still have some conflicts as to uh, you know the interpretation of tradition. By the way, there's a book uh, I can recommend by Daniel Brown, uh, "Rethinking Tradition in Islam." It's well worth a read. He, he touches on this issue as well. So we we need to re-examine, I think, our own tradition and, and come to the realization that the use of use of akl is not un-Islamic at all, and that it, as long as we don't place it above revelation, we, we should be okay. But as you know, the Mutazilites were accused of placing uh, the akl above the, 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 the mm -hmm. revelation. And that was fault. They were faulted for doing that. But what about traditional Muslims? What what have they done? Actually, they, if you look closely, 
something similar happened in traditional Islam, except what was placed above uh, the, the Quran was not Akko, it was the Sunnah. And I'll be quite forthright about it. Uh, there's a famous statement among the exegetes that uh, Asuna Kadi Allah Quran, the Sunnah judges the Quran. Uh, this statement mm -hmm. is mentioned by Taha Jabir Alwan in, in his book called, uh, you know, the Reviving the Balance, 2017 IT. And it is also mentioned by um, Muhammad Shahrur in his book called The Quran, Morality and Critical reason and they both say that this is very problematic there should be no reversal of the relationship between quran and sunnah the quran has yeah. the top and we should never put anything above it that includes akal or reason but it also includes nakal tradition i feel in and and i, I want to kind of expand on that uh, with you so i feel that what what happens in this false dichotomy <laughs> is um, people are asked, do you prefer, do you give preference to your aql or to the word of Allah? Now, this by its very nature, the question is so wrongly placed and it is so misconstrued and emotionally charged that it's, it is setting some the whole thing up for failure because it's it's basically like if i ask you um like what the thing by default is trying it's it sounds as an affront to god because if i say to you okay so do you prefer you or do you prefer god because this is what it's you know if you're going to reduce the question like as an equation <clears throat> mathematically it comes down to saying okay do you choose you or do you choose god and that's categorically wrong. And I feel that it was maybe framed in this way, whether it was by chance or by choice, to obviously demonize certain people. Now, because in essence, what the question translates as, you see, when you reduce the question, you translate it uh, as in uh, the equivalent, is that saying you can only understand, because you can only understand God through your understanding. Of course. So what you're in essence saying, what it ought to say is, do you prefer your understanding of what God is saying over such and such person's understanding of what God is saying? Because really, that's what it comes down to. Uh, if it's going to be truly framed, because if I was going to say, well, you know, you're saying that, I understand. But for example, let's say, Imam so-and-so has said this, so do you prefer your understanding over Imam or Sheikh so-and-so's understanding of this mas'ala or this verse or this interpretation? But when you reduce, let's say you remove the Sheikh or the Imam out of that equation and you just put it as God, and you say, well, do you prefer God <laughs> over you? It's a bit like when in the madhabs, people would say, Oh, um, they would say, do you, well, uh, do you give preference to Imam Abu Hanifa or Imam Malik, or do you give preference to the Prophet, his hadith? Now, what really ought to be say, said is that, well, do you give preference, for example, what you ought to be saying is to the sunnah that this Imam chose over the sunnah that is transmitted by this particular muhaddith. So it's like for like, it's the prophet's teaching here versus the prophet's teaching or the interpretation of the prophet's teaching here, whether it's right or wrong is not important right now, but the interpretation versus this uh, narration and interpretation of choice as presented by this Hadith scholar. So it's like for like, because when the moment I say, oh, so the fatwa of Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Hanifa is this, and the Hadith of the prophet is this. You see, or the verse of the Quran says this, you know, you, it's not like for like. And you, it's disrespectful to even attempt to answer that because the moment you're even trying to answer it, you're sounding this, wait a minute, this is an insult to Allah and his messenger. So, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I would emphasize that the reason or akal is actually a means to attain knowledge, you of know. Course. 
So how can we attain knowledge if we don't use our akal? I mean, we cannot even cross a street safely without using our reason. We'll get run over by a lorry and the moment we try to do that. So it is impossible to avoid using reason. And there you know? is no, because this is what Fakhruddin al-Razi is writing in his whole, you know, the, the akal and nakal debate. He's saying, look, language by its nature is built upon muqaddimat. It's built upon certain precepts and, and concepts which are rational, which are to do with the brain. So the moment you say some words, it all depends on how I compute and rationalize those words. So to say, well, remove your aql out of the equation, it just means you're m mentally incapable. You, you're just a, somebody that's majnoon, doesn't have an aql. So that and that person is غير مكلف شرعاً. Yeah, I think what uh, some of our traditional brothers and sisters want us to do is to not so much to use our own reason, not so much to have our own opinion, but to use our uh, sheikh's reason or our, mm. our uh, ulama's reason. Our, I remember asking a lady, she was a, a rector of a, one of the universities here. I asked her what was her opinion about this verse in the Quran where Allah says that you know, women, uh, men and women are equal, but uh, men have a degree of advantage over the women. In, uh, darajat is the Arabic word used. And she gave a very surprising answer. She didn't give me her opinion. She gave me a, a half a dozen opinions of six, half a dozen different scholars. But that was not my question. I wanted to know what she thought about it. She hesitated to say it because she was brought up to believe that in the words of one of my other uh, former colleagues, who was a very fine brother and gentleman in every other respect, he was a graduate of Medina University. And when I told him one time, you know, what's your opinion on this or something along the, all those lines, he responded to me, uh, by, he responded by saying, oh, brother, but I think it's dangerous to have your own opinion. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have an opinion. He had the opinion of the scholars that he was following. And I was so astonished by his response that I didn't know what to respond at first. Quite frankly, he, took, he got me off guard. And but a couple of uh, a little bit uh, some time later, I realized what my answer should have been or should be. And actually, I shared with him this answer. And I, uh, when we met up again, I, I told him that, by the way, brother, in relation to your earlier, you know, remark, uh, your uh, your uh, perception that we should not, uh, it's dangerous to have uh, your own opinion. I would say that actually, I think it's dangerous not to have your own opinion yeah. because if you don't have your own opinion you will have someone else's opinion 100%. and what if that someone else is not giving you the correct opinion what if that someone else says to you that Allah wants you to go and blow yourself up in a train station what are you going to do are you going to follow that opinion see so, and the, I'll tell you how they'll caveat that you see they'll caveat it by well safety is then in numbers because then it becomes a numbers game democratizing uh, opinions well they'll say well so long as the let's say a multiplicity of people or the majority of people that they uh, are familiar with follow that then it's okay uh, i'm obviously not to blow themselves up but i mean for the opinion that is yeah so, yeah, and we encounter this. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I now participate in some of these clubhouse uh, debates. And by the way, uh, I don't know if I can, you don't mind me mentioning that uh, two of our rooms are progressive That's Muslims right. and uh, and uh, Muslim reverts. And there's also a room that Edith Buxel uh, runs, I think something to do with the number 19 mm -hmm. and, and so on, and Islam uh, according to God and so on. There's a few anyway. So we encounter this objection from some of our Muslim, uh, uh, Sun, uh, brothers and sisters. They say, well, who are you to have to talk about this? Uh, who are you to have a different opinion from all these scholars? Are you saying that all these scholars, scholars in 1,400 years got it wrong? you know but we have to remind them that you know what happened in the christian faith is that for um, uh, longer than that people have subscribed to for instance the doctrine of trinity and allah says clearly in our quran la taqulu thalatha don't say three mm -hmm. so they have been victims of uh, delusion for more than 1400 years so just because somebody believes something for a millennium or longer doesn't make it right so sure and I, what i would say is it also weighs on what is at stake you see because because there's many opinions which to be honest 
Um, it's kind of night. The way I see them, it's neither here, neither there. They're opinions. You know, within fiqh, you've got so many opinions. Whether a person follows this, follows that. To me, these things make very little difference. Uh, but then there's some things which are gravely at stake because they're not just opinions. They're things which you nest an entire edifice and a building on. So, for example, this thing of reason. Where does reason, like, are we allowed to have opinions? Are we allowed to have independent thought? Can we think for ourselves? Can This is less so a fiqhi opinion and more so an entire foundation because your whole thing could be now silenced and controlled and um, and, and that is, uh, uh, to me, very dangerous. I would feel that this a lot of this whole thing begins with political kind of sectarianism, uh, the politics of sectarianism, and I feel that what happens, <laughs> Allahu a'lam, but my kind of theory into what happened here was that the in early Islam there was no mainstream. I mean, there was no body or, or identity of mainstream Muslims. Uh, so mainstream Muslims for the first uh, almost two to three hundred years don't have a, a name for themselves. You know, like they don't call themselves um, or, or at least for 200 years, at least they don't re they don't, for example, call themselves Sunni or they don't have uh, a name that we are Ahl Sunnah. This does, doesn't exist. So Imam Malik would never have said I am Ahl Sunnah because this word didn't exist like that in his time. Um so the question was, in early Islam, how do you maintain the, 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 how do you maintain orthodoxy and how is orthodoxy created? So the early methodology that follows for the first, you know, one to two hundred years of Islam is by exclusion. So we know the center by the periphery. So what we will do is we will say we are not so and so we are not so we are not those who curse abu bakr and umar so we as abu hanifa in his famous statements when when he was asked who are you and he said well you know we nuhibbu shaykhin and we we love the first two caliphs and and we do and and so on and so forth wa nara al mas'al al khufain and we kind of do mas and so he's he's using symbols uh, of rulings which exemplify the periphery. So, for example, the Shia do this, they do this, the Khawarij do this. So we don't call uh, any, uh, any sinful person a kafir. This is excluding, you're saying, you're identifying by disidentifying with the, with the other sects. So this is how Muslims were doing it. They didn't have a mainstream name. And then the key movement becomes by affiliating with hadith. This becomes like an identity marker. So many, and this is why Imam Abu Hanifa, you know, got unfortunately targeted because he wasn't identified with hadith. He didn't identify with hadith. Uh, when I say identify, I mean he didn't preoccupy himself with the mastery of hadith. He was not seen as a major muhaddith or whereas Malik and uh, and the other scholars, Awza'i and even arguably Sufyan al-Thawri and Sufyan ibn Uyayna and all these other scholars are involved in hadith. So you've got this going on. Now the Mu'tazila are emerging because they, they are there and they start to uh, have certain opinions. And, and I feel in the generations that follow, Sunni scholars, uh, what we're calling Sunni, they obviously developed this name with Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari. <coughs> they demonize the kind of ridicule arguments they're facing. So when uh, some Mu'tazila, who were, you know, very powerful thinkers, they said to them, oh, so um, do you believe in such and such? Do you believe in such and such? So one of the knee-jerk reactions was this kind of like a, a silly argument, but to say, <laughs> you, you're giving your own aql preference over hadith. You know, it's like one of those to win like a crowd pleaser moment. Say, oh, oh my God, this guy, he's he's rejecting this hadith because he's preferring his own aql. Whereas the tradition 
really speaking, has already done that. Like Imam Abu Hanifa, for example, used to say we don't go by that hadith. Imam Malik used to, in his Mu'atta, reject several hadith. The tradition already had this, but by people using this as a symbol to, as a shield against a Mu'tazila, it became symbolic of the Sunni orthodoxy all of a sudden. That, oh, we, by the way, and, you know, to reinforce it, People started, I feel, almost as a sense of bravado, making a point. By the way, we accept these hadith that seem irrational. And like finding an example, like let's say you find a hadith that says, well, uh, that's, let's say, I don't know, that appeared to them as irrational. They would say, well, we accept this. See, this is our motto. This is our symbol. Where, whereas a quick thing could have been, I feel a quick, real argument could have been, and people forget this about the Mu'tazila, is the Mu'tazila's first core belief was that any person who commits a sin is no longer a Muslim. They're not a I think that was the Khawarij, no? Uh, is no, it true no that... so, so, yes and no. So the Mu'tazila, they have Usul al-Khamsa, the five, uh, which Abdul Jabbar al jabbar and all these people still write books on uh, generations later. Their first Asal, from the Usul al-Khamsa, the five pillars of Mu'tazila faith, um, is that a person who commits a sin is no longer a Muslim, but he's not a kafir. He is in a purgatory state. We call it, they call it manzila bain al-manzilatayn, that he's in a state between the two states of Islam or Iman and Kufr. But he's not a Muslim, so they won't call him a Muslim, but they don't call him a kafir. Now, to be honest, this would have been the real strength to get them on. You know, for the Sunni orthodoxy to respond, this was their kind of gold mine. This was the jugular vein, because that is clearly a point of extremism. Now, the Muslims could have, like, the, they could have gone in on this. But unfortunately, they went in on this aql point. Like, ha, 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 you know, these guys use their aql, these guys use their aql. And this propaganda they started to spread about Akal and demonizing Akal all of a sudden, it created a crisis, which we're still suffering from today, because we, we how do we undo the damage? <laughs> Good point. In fact, it brings to mind a book by Abdul Hamid Abu Sulaiman uh, called The Crisis in the Muslim Mind. Mm. Uh, the Crisis in the Muslim Mind, an excellent book, and I highly recommend it. It's available online, free in PDF format. It was published in, the English translation was published in 1993 by Triple IT. Absolutely. We have a crisis in the Muslim mind now as a result of this uh, belittling of reasoning and belittling of Akko. And by the way, Mustafa Akio also wrote the book, just published this year, called um, Reopening Muslim Minds. Um, and by the way, that title of that book sounds very similar to the title of my former teacher, Alan Bloom, who, who titled his book called The Closing of the American Mind. So oh. there's a lot of talk about opening minds. It doesn't <laughs> only happen to the Muslims. I guess it, according to Bloom, it also happened in America, you know. Mm. And somehow higher education fail, is failing yeah. the young people. And it's interesting it how you... Just not to not to kind of get distracted with this, but just a, a tangential note, how we see that, you see, it's a mindset debate. The topics could be anything like recently we saw, for example, vaxxers versus anti-vaxxers yeah. and that same sectarian mentality being used. And you could fit it anywhere. You know, you get there was a movie, uh, a recent movie, um, Don't Look Up. And I don't know if you've watched it and you're into movies, Leonardo DiCaprio, it's on, I think, Netflix. But uh, they have this thing where this meteor is coming to, it's going to you know, crash into Earth and destroy the Earth. And some people want to back it and the politicians are saying ignore it. But they have this slogan in it that look, uh, just look up there, you can see the meteor, the asteroid or, or the comet, sorry. And the other people start an anti-movement called hashtag don't look up. And it's the same sectarian like what we've got with COVID and, you know, hashtag uh, or the anti-vaxxers kind of movement. And uh, and it's you see the same mentality, the same sectarianism, the same tribalism, uh, but just the words are different. <laughs> you know, the slogans are different. 
Yeah, uh, by the way, there's also another book uh, relating to the Muslim mind, although this one I have to mention was written by a non-Muslim, and his name is uh, Riley, Robert Riley, and it's called The Closing of the Muslim Mind. So here oh, wow. he's also borrowing. <laughs> and by the way, it's also available online, free in PDF format for those who would like to, um, you know, delve into it. And, but he basically takes up the argument according to which, um, you know, People like Imam Al Ghazali are partly to blame for the sad condition of uh, the Muslim Ooh, Ummah what, today. Because what, like uh, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson also? Has yeah, along to... those lines. Yeah, but there's also a, a Muslim uh, a fellow called uh, Gamal. He wrote on his blog also faulting Ghazali for the uh, decline of the Muslim civilization because of his uh, alleged uh, belittling of rationality. And there's also Umar Chapra. Uh, he wrote a book and an article called uh, Is Rationalism Possible in Islam uh, or in Contemporary Islam? And he also faults Al-Ghazali, Imam Al-Ghazali, for destroying rationality in Muslim thought by rejecting the doctrine of causality, by rejecting mm -hmm. the doctrine of the efficient causes. In other words, if I turn on a light switch, it's, yeah. it is not me who is turning on the light, but it is Allah who is doing it. So we... we, we uh... I feel that that was such, you know, this occasionalism that they yeah. went into in Ash'ari thought. I feel it was an kind of an unnecessary point. Like they, 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 they put so much energy and, you know, investment resources into this argument which is basically saying that, look, Allah, for those who are not familiar with it, that Allah is the primary uh, means and agent for every single phenomenon on earth, whether it's, you know, the movement. So, for example, whether it's gravity, whether it's anything, it's not uh, anything else. Whereas the other argument would be still that it's Allah is in control, but Allah has created forces that then do their job. Like Allah has created, let's say, the, the force of gravity. Now, gravity does its job. Allah does not need to himself be that, he, with his essence, be pulling the cup down whilst the, let's say, the ant antagonistic force is pushing it up as well at the same time. And so Allah is not doing both of these. He's just created a system that allows it to work. So just as Allah, for example, has created for you a digestive system. So when you eat something, your digestive system is working. Now to say, well, your digestive system isn't actually working. Allah is making those things, each thing move around and each thing, you know, it's like in such an unnecessary and it really just shows to me a, a poor sense of philosophizing. Like, this is just such a, like, what you guys wasted so much resources on this argument. <laughs> like, I don't get, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, this is uh, this is an issue. And um, I think and, uh, we need to, like, look at the condition of Muslim universities today, which is, I think, to some extent, a result of this anti-rationalism. According to a study and a conference uh, 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 that took place in Turkey in 2017, and the uh, proceedings are published on uh, the Internet, they point out that the people that put this conference together point out that in uh, 150 universities globally, not a single university is uh, Muslim, is a Muslim university. We do not have a single Islamic university in the top 150 universities. What about the number of patents? The number of patents in the Arab world from 1980 to 1990, I think total about 370. Compare this to 16,000 patents by South Korea. What is going on? Why is the condition of Muslim education uh, in such a terrible shape? Yeah. What does it take to, 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 to uh, reverse the trend? That, that is so, honestly, that is so deeply hurtful to just even uh, just ponder those figures because it is so indicative of the real situation, isn't it? It just, everything just gets real all of a sudden. Like, it's like, damn. And there is a lot of intelligence, you know, and a lot of incredible talent in the Muslim world. So something is either blocking or it's just not allowing that talent and intelligence to kind of uh, to, to to perform in this way, yeah. 
Yeah, so I mean, uh, I remember there was a case of a fellow that wanted to do a critique. He was a Yemeni fellow. He wanted to do a critique of Al Shafi. I heard this from a friend who, okay, from, who heard it from him. And uh, the response that he got from his dean or his supervisor, the, his dean put his hand on the telephone and said to him, if you are going to do a critique of Al Shafi, I'm calling the police right now. Wow. Can you believe that? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, so that's, of course that's the... crazy. That's just like wow. And you see this. Uh, there is um, there's a scholar. Um, I'm not sure. I think he may have passed away now. But it's a scholar from Pakistan, um, who uh, his name was uh, Maulana Ahmed Saeed, I believe. Um, and so he wrote a book called uh, where he did a critique of. It's not a detailed book. It's a small book, but it was a critique of Bukhari. Um, and he, it's called Quran al Muqaddas or Bukhari al Muhaddas or, or Bukhari al Muhaddas or something. He, he's put it like, I think Muhaddas is the word he puts it as. And what he's arguing is that, okay, he's taking an, a, a, an, a radical position. I accept that. And he, he is stating that the, he's critiquing Sahil Bukhari. He's arguing that Sahil Bukhari is fabricated by somebody else. Like there's some hands at play. And then he says, and he's very uses strong language in condemning um, certain ahadith in Bukhari, which are blasphemous to the Prophet. So he brings the example as well of the hadith that the Prophet tries to touch a woman by force and like sexually touch her. And he says that, and, and these are some examples of, he brings a few saying that, look, this, there's no way. he. So he concludes by saying, look, and it's not a big book. Um, he concludes by saying that, look, this, this is completely, this is not the character of the Prophet wasallam. And secondly, he says that I don't believe the likes of Imam Bukhari, who was such a pious person, would put this in his book. So this is been somebody has played with the books throughout the generation. He doesn't give a detailed analysis of the Sanad or of Rabri or anything. He doesn't say who. He just kind of leaves it, and it's a small book. Now he, if uh, from what I uh, from what I'd read and and heard that he, I'm pretty sure was imprisoned over this because they they kind of uh, they charged him with certain charges, saying that he's uh, attacking religion and he's kind of. Um, you know, this is he's disturbing the peace, and he's kind of uh, like you said, like they called the police on him, and I'm pretty sure he went to prison for that. It's like wow, you know, <laughs> and and the interesting thing is that people are you see what they fail to see is that even if you disagree with it, and I get it that you see people get shaken because they think, oh my god, this is the tradition. You know, if this goes, then it's is it going to be like a row of dominoes? Like, does it just all fall? And people get scared, but and they're coming from a place of love to preserve the deen, but they have to understand that the other person is coming from a place of love for the honor of the Prophet. So yeah. Yeah, it reminds me, mentioning Bukhari, you know, when I started my work at the Islamic Science University here in Malaysia, you know, as a convert, I, I wanted to be a good Muslim. So I was reading my Quran every day and I was reading my Bukhari every day also. So everything fine and good until I came one day to one hadith that totally shocked me. And I'm sure you heard of this hadith. It was a hadith according to which the Prophet, peace be on him, wanted to burn down somebody's house because he saw this person was not getting ready to go to Friday prayer. I was shocked. Burn down the house? Uh, I think that's called arson. And I think that's a crime. Am I supposed to believe that the noble messenger of Allah who brought us the message to teach us how to be good people is suggesting that he wants to commit a crime and actually expressing his opinion about it to his friend? Brother, I can share with you, that was the day that I stopped reading Bukhari and I never went back. And I know later on I found out that other people feel the same way. And later on I found out there are actually much worse hadiths than that about a prophet, for instance, gouging somebody's eyes out with hot irons, about the hadith about drinking urine, or the hadith about the fly, that you have to press the fly into your coffee. 
and many other problematic hadiths where the Prophet allegedly sent a death squad to murder a, a, a woman, pregnant woman in her sleep because she wrote some unflattering poetry about him. Who in his right mind could accept such stories about the noble messenger of Allah? So I, and not only that, the look Prophet's at, character was a paragon, an absolute embodiment of mercy and love for the world. And, and even described in the Qur'an with the sifa that is used to describe God, in a way I'm saying, uh, like he's a Ra'uf Rahim. You know, this is, I mean, people can have the name Rahim. I'm just saying that, look, this is the description. Uh, somebody that is always about mercy. It hurts him to see that even one person, uh, you know, when he heard, that oh, in the uh, in the incident with uh, Khalid bin Walid radiallahu an, when somebody had said oh, but that person embraced Islam right in, in the battle, uh, and but it was you know it was like too late. Khalid had kind of pressed in with his sword, and and the Prophet was so hurt. He said, uh, and and he said no, you know he they're saying he just said that as a safety so he could get the upper hand. And the Prophet said, I wish the qalba. That did you? Really, t did you look into his heart? That this, the, the kind of the concern, the empathy and compassion. Yeah. So another issue, I mean, coming back to Bukhari, you know, I mean, um, Sheikh Hassan Farhan al Maliki points out that uh, Bukhari does not contain a single book on justice. He also points out that Bukhari does not contain a single book on ethics. He also points out that Bukhari does not contain a single book on Akko. So how did this happen? Akal. How is it? As in Akal? Yeah. Akal. Yes. So how did this happen and what kind of, and by the way, I might add, al Shatibi, the author of the higher purposes of the Sharia, I noticed that it does not include justice as one of the objectives of the law. Why is justice omitted from his list of the objectives of the Sharia? Shouldn't it be one of the central objectives of the of the Sharia, justice? How come it got left out? Wow, I never, you know, I've actually read his muafaqat uh, many years back. I finished the whole thing. And um, now that you say that, I I don't recall it, but I'm so surprised. I'll have to double that. Wow, okay, if he left... Uh, he does. I know he emphasizes that the whole Sharia, the objective is welfare, maslaha, maslaha. But adl um, is obviously inna ma ya'murukum bil adli wal ihsan. You know, you could sum up the entirety of Islam in that verse of the Quran that Allah just commands you for these things. That just really justice and a compassionate kind of kindness. Um, but yeah. I even remember reading in one book that uh, I had, uh, it was edited by Allah Eddin Kharofa, who was an Iraqi uh, scholar. And there was an article in it by a fellow called Al-Raji. I don't remember his last, uh, first name, but he wrote in it at the very end. He says that he actually wrote that justice is alien to Islam. I could not believe my eyes when I read that. It was followed by three dots. I think the editor cut out the rest of it. Maybe it was worse. So justice actually in the Quran is second only to taqwa, if I understand uh, it correctly. And there are two beautiful verses about justice in the Quran. Oh, you who believe stand up for justice even against your own self and so on and so forth. You know this verse. Mm -hmm. So what kind of Islam are we getting from Bukhari? Are we getting Islam that is devoid of justice? Are we getting Islam that is devoid of ethics? You know, you see, look but, at the yeah, well, go I was ahead, going go to ahead. say one. You see, one question here because I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you where I'm at with this, and people often ask me. This is how I I I advise, and this is my kind of where I'm at, is that it's not. You see, I've never been. I'm not uh, against uh, Sahih al Bukhari or Sahih Muslim or any of these books. I've actually studied them all. Cover to cover, I've actually got an isnad going back to Imam Bukhari in it, a chain of transmission. I just simply say to people that, look, uh, that hadith books, of course, you know, th there's going to, we just have to accept that there will be a margin of error. That's all. 
It doesn't mean that, let's say Bukhari now has, on average, let's say 7,000, whether it's 500 or 700, 7,700 7, hadith or whatever it is, give or take. Now, even 5 to 10% of that, if a person just took that, right, you're looking at, if you're looking at 7,000 hadith, and you're looking at now even 700, whoa, even 300 hadith, when people take out the problematic hadith, they ain't actually that many. I mean, when even if there are a few hundred, compared to the thousands, the overwhelming amount of hadith are usually just describing an event or saying, well, this happened, or it's just saying, well, the time of Salah was like this, or it was like this, or, you know, this verse, giving a little tafsir to it. <clears throat> it's not like, to me, I'm not... Um, so w the way I see it, it's not about rejecting a tradition. I'm not... Uh, so I, I'm curious where, where, how you'd stand on that. To me, it's about just saying, look, our tradition generally did not come to us classically through books of hadith. So scholars like Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa used to distinguish between sunnah and hadith. So the books of hadith were like databases. They were like historical records. Normal common people didn't have access to them. And in the past, it was actually considered by many ulama haram to just go like try and buy a book of hadith and teach it because this would be called wijada. Like you can't just pick up a book of hadith and start teaching it. You had to be taught it you had to have a sanad in it. So general, the common public weren't taught Islam through hadith. They were taught it through the living tradition, which often may have been fiqh and fatwas and other things and stories and maybe listening in the masjid to tafsir and stuff like this. So that's, so, so this making this important distinction that today, because people can buy books of hadith and they start reading them, this was never the practice. So now when you do it, it's you're going to come across something like how you came across something. You go, whoa, what the hell is this? You know, oh, I don't know this. Is this really true? Where a person finds a disturbing hadith, they do not need to. Uh, that's according to these ulama, and I'm with that, that they do not need to follow that. They do not need this. There is a margin of error. Um, so it's not, I'm not saying let's, burn books and throw away books and all these people were evil people. They weren't evil people. I believe they, you know, did a tremendous job for human beings. But like any human being, it's going to have errors in there. It's going to have, you know, shortcomings. Yeah. So what are your Absol thoughts on and where, where yeah, do you absolutely. stand with that? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it reminds me of the time when I converted to Islam back in 1992 in Vancouver. Uh, my uh, guide was a fellow from Pakistan, a very happy type of, uh, who gave me the cop first copy of my Quran, Abdul Yusuf Ali translation with the, uh, the uh, transliteration. So after my conversion, we went into this hall, uh, you know, to, to look at some uh, books, you know, that were being displayed and sold there. So I saw on the table, I, I already had my copy of the Quran with me and I saw a book called uh, The 40 Hadiths. So I picked it up and then I said, hmm, well, I'm becoming a Muslim, so I should know something about the Hadiths. So I bought the book. And then I looked at his face. When I was buying that book, I looked at his face and he looked suddenly so dejected and so demoralized as if I really disappointed him by buying that book of the Hadith. <laughs> and I, I was struggling to explain the change in his countenance. So, uh, yeah, I was uh, surprised. Uh, the, uh, the, but maybe he was a, more of a Quran mainly type of guy, mm. let me put it that way. Although we now have quite a few people who say we are Quran only and whatnot. But anyway, it also reminds me, uh, your comments of this idea that, you know, the whole science of Hadith, we need to remember several facts. One is that the, the Muslim ulama acknowledge themselves that the science was less than perfect. Why? because uh, the emphasis that was placed on Isnad was perhaps disproportionate compared to the emphasis that was placed on Matan. The meaning of the Hadith was neglected. And many Hadiths uh, were accepted, which had excellent Isnad, but they actually contradicted the Quran. And we have such Hadiths, for example, the Hadith on apostasy and adultery. Uh, yet they were classified as Sahih. So how did these Hadiths become Sahih if they conflict with the Quran? Please help me out if I'm missing something. Yeah, I mean, that's such a huge topic. Yeah, I think let's speak about that. The centrality of the Quran and the supremacy of the Quran. 
this is a non-negotiable. Uh, according to, uh, you know, main, I, definitely according to the school of Medina, according to the school of Abu Hanifa, the Hanafi school as well, very clearly, and I feel that it should be the, according to every Muslim as well, but I understand that the Shafi'i school and some of the Hanbalis kind of saw things a bit differently. And that the Qur'an is always paramount. Nothing can question the Qur'an. And to say that uh, we have a narration. So Imam Malik, for example, there is the very famous narration that if a dog licks a bowl that you have to, you know, this is kind of, you have to throw the water, spill the water and wash it seven times. And, or, you know, some narrations say one time with soil and all this stuff. Now, Imam Malik very famously says that قَدْ جَاءَ هَذَا الْخَبَرِ He says, yes, we have this riwayah. We have it. He says, وَلَا نَدْرِ مَا حَقِيقَةُ He says, I don't know what it, what is it supposed to mean. Because, he says, because the Qur'an tells us that we can use a dog to hunt. So he says, كَيْفَ يُؤْكَلُ صَيْدُهُ How can we eat its prey? وَيُكْرَهْ لُعَابُهُ Whereas its sliver... If its sliver is to be refrained from, how can we use it for prey as as to, as a hunting dog? He says so. The, and this principle of always saying, "Look, yes, we have hadith that are being documented, but you have a living tradition, a sunnah that we inherit, like from father to child, the practice, the living tradition, and you have the Quran, the Quran above everything. This is such an important theme." Um, yeah, I mean, sh sh please, let's get your thoughts on this. This is so important. Yeah, the other thing I would mention is that uh, before I uh, came to a, a certain passage in actually the work of my former boss, uh, Muhammad Hashim Kamali, he writes in his book on jurisprudence, Principles of Islamic Jurisprudence, which, by the way, is used as a reference book at Harvard University and has is been cited extensively. In fact, I was informed that he is the single most uh, cited uh, Sharia scholar in the world in the English language. I Who's this, to. sorry? Muhammad Hashim Kamali, Professor Muhammad Hashim Kamali. He's the CEO uh, of uh, the International Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies, and he was my boss for practically 10 years. I was practically his right-hand man, uh, did a fair bit of editing for him, and then I started to do a bit of writing under his guidance, and may Allah reward him for all the good work that he has been doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, but what I, I remember reading in his book that the hadith, you see, <clears throat> the hadith are actually not verbatim words of the Prophet. These uh, hadiths are paraphrases. Mm. The hadiths are actually the words of the narrators. Mm. But they are not uh, verbatim words of the Prophet. So when we say the Prophet said this or that, is it entirely accurate to say that? Or should we say, according to so-and-so, the Prophet said this or the Prophet said that? The, this raises the additional question. Is if the, and by the way, Abu Hanifa, according to Daniel Brown, would only accept hadiths which were verbatim. He would not accept any hadith that was not the exact that was words of the Prophet. Im Imam Malik as well. Imam Malik was one of the few <clears throat> who said that the 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 words of the hadith had to be they had to be verbatim, they had to be that they could not be paraphrased. The person could not be what you call in Arabic, uh, for those that are coming across this discussion or want to research it, they call it riwayah bil ma'na. That can you transmit according to the meaning? And the problem with that is maybe you've misunderstood it. So you go on to tell the meaning, but surprisingly, you are right. And in Tadrib al Rawi and all these books, Jalal al Din Asyuti and other people will highlight that uh, the majority of the ulama, muhaddithin, go with riwayah bil ma'na is okay. That you can paraphrase. Um, and the minority, people like Imam Malik, uh, amongst a few others, said that no, you don't do riwayah bil ma'na, you transmit it as it. Um, and they use the hadith that you see. So, this camp of ulama, they say the, the, the hadith that the Prophet said, Allahu imra'an, that may Allah uh, enlighten a person and bless him who heard my words. Kama sami'aha, and he transmitted it as he heard it. So they say this 
Um, and they also use the hadith that Rubba Hamili Fiqhin, that uh, the Prophet said in a hadith that people will take my words. And he said, Rubba Hamili Fiqhin, ila man huwa afqahu min. That many a people will, and it begins by uh, fal yusma, uh, those of you that are present, fal yusma il hadir al ghaib. The Prophet said that th those who are here today hearing my words, let them transmit it to those who are absent. And then the Prophet g explains further, and in there he says that for many a person carrying a set of words will carry them to someone who understands them far better than the one transmitting them. So this is all evidence to say that the words ought to be kind of fixed, not paraphrased. But unfortunately, that side, they didn't win the cultural war. So the cultural kind of war was won by the other camp, which said that, no, we can trans transmit with meaning. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I don't know whether I should bring this up, but the war was not merely cultural, brother. I'm sure you know that when uh, al-Mutawakil reversed the policy of the Mutazilites, mm -hmm. apparently there was some persecution that took place of the rationalists and the Mutazilites under his rule. And you can find it, some of the details of this persecution. People lost their jobs, sometimes their lives. They had to escape. And the details of this uh, persecution you may find in a book called Islam and Science, written by a Pakistani. A scholar called uh, Pervez Hoodboy. Now, it, the book is also well, available. I've heard of him actually. A few people yeah, have but... told me actually to uh, to get him on my track. I don't, I don't. I've never actually listened to anything of his or read him, but I've heard of his name a couple of times being mentioned. Oh, absolutely. I would recommend him to, to, on your show. Uh, very worth uh, listening to. But now to, to come back to this issue of the Hadith, one question that arises from the fact that the Hadith are not exact words of the Prophet, that they are not verbatim. One question that arises, I think, is then how could any Hadith have been classified as Sahih if it is not verbatim? I mean, what is your definition of sahi? Does it have to be, can it be a paraphrase or would it have to be a verbatim transition, uh, transmission if you want to consider it authentic? I mean, what exactly is authentic report? You see, I can think I the, the problem here <clears throat> is with verbiage. It's with wordings. Because there's an overlap between a technical term and between a common usage of that term. So you see, Sahih, when used by the Muhaddithin, like Imam Malik, let's say, obviously these terms come slightly after him, but when he's considering something by their standard to be Sahih, it carries a set of conditions, let's say. There's Ittisal al Sanad, there's Dabt al Ruwat, Adl al Ruwat, stuff like this. Like these transmitters are, let's say, you know, they're reliable, let's say, generally speaking. They generally know what they're doing. Uh, there's, there's a connection in the chain. When it's, when it's kind of stamped with this term sahih, sahih here just really means that the chain is connected, apparently, to the best of the knowledge of this authenticator. So to the best of my knowledge, this chain is authentic. Like as in you heard it from you, from you, from him. That's it. And you guys meet the apparent conditions. It does not technically mean the casual understanding of the word sahih, which is that something is always correct. So the problem is blurring the lines because, you see, this is why Imam Malik, for example, will bring many hadith from the golden chain, from Malik, from Nafi, from Ibn Umar, which Imam Bukhari says is Silsila Dhahabiyya, the golden chain. And Imam Bukhari will say, by the way, I'm oh, sorry, Imam Malik will say in the Muatta, by the way, we don't act according to this hadith. Um, he brings it himself. He says, here it is. But he doesn't act according to it. He says, we in Medina don't act according to this hadith. So, I feel that one of the problems, Allahu A'lam, but my analysis is what adds to the confusion is this word. Like, let's say the word Sahih, they used a different word in, like, let's say they used the word, I'm just saying, hypothetically, I know it's not, it's an approximation. Let's say they used the word, this is Muttasil. So it's connected. Now, I know they're going to say it's, there's other nuances, but let's just say they use that word. Like they say, oh, this hadith in Bukhari is Muttasil. 
Now, muttasil to the common person doesn't mean anything. Like, it just means it's connected. It doesn't... Whereas when I use the word, this hadith is sahih, which in common Arabic means, oh, it's correct or authentic. You see, this carries a different nuance because then the person thinks, oh, but it's sahih. You see, because that now I'm using that word as a, as a normal word as well. So I think this adds partially to the complexity of what we're dealing with. Oh, absolutely. Language is very important. In fact, there's a book on this called uh, Language and Islamic Law, I think Cambridge University Press, published by, uh, written by a fellow called uh, Ramich. Uh, Shukriya Hussein Ramich, he goes into some of this stuff. I, I certainly recommend that book. But the other issue with the Hadith, uh, as we are on a subject, is you see, I have also puzzled over this. I've read in some of the sources that I'm using for, for my own work that uh, apparently the Prophet, peace be on him, actually prohibited writing the Hadith. And this is, uh, there's a fellow called Hudri, and there's a hadith in Muslim, uh, which uh, reports this. And I also read uh, this in the work of Taha Jabir al-Wani, Reviving the Balance. He refers to this hadith. There's Abdul Rab uh, on Academia, who also has an article where he uh, says that the Prophet, peace be on him, actually prohibited the use of the hadith. Also, Muhammad Shahrur mentions this prohibition of the hadith. So, if the Prophet prohibited writing of the hadith, and if Allah says in the Quran that we should obey Allah and the Messenger, then and the people who compiled the hadith collections, did they actually obey the Prophet by collecting all these narrations? What's your take on that, brother? I would be interested to know. Sure. I mean, that's, uh, that's definitely an interesting question. I think what happens <clears throat> is the early school of the, if we can call them the proto muhaddithin so they're very early in Islam when hadith are, first of all, just being kind of roughly documented. They, you know, leading up to the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, let's say, where he commissions the collection under Zuhari. Just prior to this, when people are documenting their own hadith um, on whatever kind of uh, papyri or whatever they've got, at this stage, this discussion is a matter of debate because there is a teaching from like that you've mentioned where the Prophet ﷺ says, don't write it because some of the companions say we used to write down what the Prophet would teach us just as we would write down things from the Quran. And, and, and the narrator says the Prophet reprimanded us and said, don't write down my words. Don't mix anything with the Quran. Um, there is another narration. So, so this side that argued that we should never write down the hadith, they used this as a, as their kind of arguments. The other side use a narration, I believe, from Hajjatul Wida, where uh, somebody approaches the Prophet asking him uh, for a particular, I believe it's a dua, or he's asking the Prophet for something and the Prophet tells him and he can't remember it. And the Prophet says to someone, Uktubha lahu, like write it down for him. Now, the other camp used this to say that, well, the Prophet in the Hajjatul Wida instructed somebody to write down what he was teaching for this person who couldn't remember it. Now, so they justify, they say that this side, that look, the reason the Prophet in the earlier hadith is telling them because that's they may be mixing it up with the Quran because the person says we used to write it as we write the Quran. So the Prophet doesn't want to mix it. I do. To me, that sounds very plausible and it sounds right. I wouldn't be against document as a person. I, I'm not against documentation of hadith. Um, I, I think that's just as everything starts to get documented because we're not going to keep everything memorized. And it is, it does provide a, and I'd like this to actually lead into a question, actually, um, for you. Because, you see, to me, Hadith, sure, this, this is a database of, this is data. And it's used for, traditionally was used by, if we'd say, like, researchers, 
it wasn't used by the common public. The common public didn't like own a copy of Sahil Bukhari or you know the the Musnad of Imam Ahmed or stuff like this. So scholars who did used it for research. To me, hadith do provide uh, amazing details. They can provide all kinds of color. They can sometimes you come across such a wonderful hadith. You're like, wow, okay, I didn't realize this is uh, so. To me, I. Um, I, I, I'm not uh, personally uh, with people who say let's disown hadith. To me, I see the middle ground and I advocate for the middle ground, which is like the teaching of Imam Malik, that we stick with the sunnah. We do take the sunnah. There's a primacy for the Quran, but we take the sunnah as the living tradition and we differentiate between <laughs> sunnah and hadith. Um, and it's not. And with hadith, there's the caveat that look just understand that there will always be it's a human effort so there will always be a margin of error uh, but i do not call for for example i understand that look this is part of a heritage it does have a lot of benefits to it, it adds color it gives us descriptions it tells us stories uh, it does all of these kind of things and the question was because i know we, we mentioned earlier we did have uh, on on mind track previously uh, dr edith as well and uh, I know some people do take the position that let's completely discard hadith, or some people feel that even hadith is something like evil, let's say. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Because I think it's a, a, it's a question worth asking, because people will definitely feel that, well, wait a minute, are you a hadith rejecter? Um, because, so so let's, let's unpack that question a bit. How, what are your thoughts on all of this, Professor? Yeah, that reminds me of a lecture I attended by uh, uh, I attended that was given by Kasim Ahmad, who was a friend of Edith Buxel, by the way. And I met uh, Kasim Ahmad myself after the lecture. He is well known uh, in Malaysia and elsewhere for writing a book uh, called uh, Hadith Reevaluation, which, by the way, was banned by the uh, um, in Malaysia. And I, in fact, recommended unbanning it <laughs> when. After he uh, in during the question period, after he spoke, and um, he pointed out an interesting fact, uh, which during his talk, which is that Bukhari, uh, according to some sources, collected as many as six hundred thousand hadiths, and he rejected ninety nine percent of them, and he only kept about six thousand of them. And interestingly, nobody called him anti hadith. How is how is that possible? So he rejected the vast majority of the hadith as not reliable, and he kept a very small part. But, but nobody just to just to caveat that, it. sorry, uh, won't people say that Imam Bukhari was not rejecting; he was just selecting? Okay, so there's fair a enough. difference. So I'm just saying yeah, because this is difference. what no, good, the good point. knee jerk reaction. Yeah, yeah good point. Uh, that brings me to the other question, and I can, uh, you know, mention that this question you just raised. I mean, the whole relationship between Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Hadith, uh, is something that we have been discussing endlessly in these clubhouse rooms. It always comes up always comes up mm -hmm. and I have been struggling with it myself in my own work what is the precise uh, nature of the relationship between the Quran and Sunnah because uh, I have come across hadiths which are very nice and, uh, and beautiful like for instance there's a hadith according to which the Prophet allegedly sent peace be on him the highest form of jihad is to speak truth to power now wow. that is a very powerful hadith okay. and because it it is very risky to speak truth to power. What happens to people who speak truth to power? What happened to Julian Assange? What ha happens to the whistleblowers? You take a huge risk when you speak truth to power. Uh, I mean, what happened to Socrates when he was teaching around Athens? He, he was also put on trial and accused of, believe it or not, apostasy. Apostasy from the many gods of the Athenians. But the point I want to come to is that there's yet one one other uh, issue here, which is when you look at the Quran, and this is something that was pointed out by Qasim Ahmad as well as by Muhammad Shahroor, and I think, I'm not sure whether uh, Alwani points this out, but there's some verses in the Quran, uh, Surah 69, verses 44 to 46, where Allah Ta'ala says to the Prophet, peace be on him, that if he were to add anything of his own opinion to revelation, Allah would take him by the hand and cut off his artery. 
Now that seems to me like a very clear prohibition of adding anything to revelation of the Quran. Yet here we have mainstream uh, ulama telling us that the Hadith is revelation. Mm -hmm. And they are, say, they are calling it uh, Vahi Batin. They developed the doctrine of dual revelation, Vahi uh, Vahiyain, and the Quran being the Vahi Zahir. So they are telling us, uh, and they are telling us not only that uh, Hadith is a uh, revelation, there's, they even have, have a Hadith to support that, according to which the Prophet, peace be on him, allegedly said that I was given two things, the Quran and something equal to it. Mm. Now, my question is, if the Hadiths are words of human beings, narrators, transmitters, uh, how can the word of a human being be equal to the word of God? Please correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm missing something. You know, as a, just a quick, like a, a reaction to that. <clears throat> See, people, right, so so this verse that, وَلَوْ تَقَوَّلَ عَلَيْنَا بَعْضَ الْأَقَاوِيلِ If he had fabricated certain things, um regarding us you know we would have taken him and he would have you know been snatched by the jugular but this would be i this would be understood presumably by people to say well if he was to distort the quran um because the context seems that if he was to taqawwala fabricate um, and say that, look, oh, you know, God said this, by the way, and God didn't say that, then there would be a very severe chastisement and punishment. But he obviously would never do that, the Prophet. ﷺ. But this is the Quran saying that. Um, that. That's just a reaction about. And I wanted to add about the Wahi thing, you see. Right. So. Okay, so here's where I'm at with this. Okay, so this is how how I see this, and this is stemming from in line with the with many of the Maliki of the school of Medina, is that I I would feel that okay when it says can the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam legislate. So I would feel that yes, he could legislate, like he could provide rulings. Um, but the, you see, when we're talking about things like fiqh, so for example, there's a hadith. Uh, now, I know this would come back to hadith and then people would say, well, if, if they problematize the entirety of hadith, then obviously this wouldn't stand. But let's say there's a hadith that the Prophet said, well, uh, when he's asked about hajj and, and he says, uh, you know, is it yes that we must do hajj? The person says, must we do hajj? He says, yes. Now that's obviously in the Quran as well. And he says, Afi kulli am, ya Rasulullah. Is it every year we should do it? And the, and the Prophet says to him that, look, what's like he, t he reprimands him that, look, what's wrong with you? Why are you constantly asking these different questions? And he says, like if I said yes, then would you be able to do it? Like it would have, be, let's say it became obligatory. Now people use that. Another, as an evidence, another hadith they use is where the Prophet is prescribing territory as sanctuary, like the sacred, like don't break, don't cut the trees, don't kind of uproot a plant in the haram of, uh, of Mecca and Medina. Now, especially Mecca. Now, there, I believe, is it, uh, 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 is it Abbas or Abdullah ibn Abbas or somebody says, when the Prophet says that, he says, Ya Rasulullah, can we make an exception for that tree, this particular tree that they need for certain, they need the branches for it for something. So the Prophet says, Illa al-Araq. It's called Araq, the tree. And he says, okay, Illa al-Araq. And in real time, the Prophet makes an exception. Now, like this, I would see that, you see, the general fiqhi rulings because in usul, um, there is an opinion. So in Jama' al Jawami, for example, Subki discusses this, other people as well. There is an opinion that the, according to some usuliyin, if the Prophet, that the rulings have somewhat of, for the Prophets, an arbitrary <coughs> nature, some of the rulings. Like they can say, okay, do this. And it becomes that. That's one opinion. Other scholars don't accept it. And he, he words it as saying like, um, whatever he was to say becomes 
the correct opinion. Um, now this, so I see this as a richness in allowing diversity and allowing, so I, I see this as a strength. Um, I, so, right, let me put that back to you. Right, so where, where, <laughs> where sure. are you with this? Where, where are you with this? Yeah, yeah, I am still struggling with that. And in terms of the legislation, uh, there are people like Shahrur who takes the view yeah. that uh, Hadith cannot be a basis for legislation. Although there are some uh, evidence in the Quran that, uh, you know, people of the book did some legislation for themselves, which Allah did not prescribe them. The Christians legislated or made uh, monasticism, uh, you know, permissible for them. And then also uh, Isa alayhi salam says that I have come to make something for you halal that was previously haram and so on. So mm. I'm Abro abrogation. That's yeah, another topic. We of, got, not, we'll, we'll move yeah. to that. That's a very interesting topic. Yeah, abrogation, but not of the entire teaching mm. of uh, the message of uh, the revelation, not not the abrogation of monotheism and so on, but yeah. abrogation of certain rulings. I think that can be accepted yeah. because we have evidence for that in the Quran. Yeah. But my problem, uh, my issue, I uh, the one, uh, I have, the issue for me is when I hear statements like I read on the website of Ibn Baz, the, the yeah. chief cleric of Saudi Arabia, who where that hadith came from, where, where the Prophet allegedly said, peace be on him, that I was given two things, Quran and something mm. equal to it. But other sources uh, cite this uh, hadith as well. But he also says uh, additionally that, I quote, the Sunnah is a part of the Quran, end of mm. quote. So now my question is, how can the Sunnah be a part of the Quran uh, without mixing the words of human beings with the words of God? Is that consistent with the teaching of Tawheed and is it consistent with maintaining the supremacy the preeminence of Allah can are we allowed to mix the words of human beings with the words of God is that permissible what's your view on that if I can now put it sure. back to you brother no, of course. Uh, shukran, shukran. <laughs> so so yeah I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that so here's how I would see that uh, <clears throat> professor I would see that in two ways yeah like so two I'm sure there's many, but two immediately coming to my mind. One which uh, is in a descriptive sense, which I would have no problem with at all, if somebody used it, it's just language. So, for example, if somebody said, well, uh, the Quran tells you to do Hajj, it doesn't give you the details, and the Prophet's life shows you the details. So, in a way, it's like it gels with the, the Quran, the Sunnah is in harmony. It's like... It's like a 3D depiction or a kind of, uh, it's a projection of the Quranic discourse. So the Quran is saying pray and by projection on the big screen, we can see the details being acted out by the life of the Prophet ﷺ. That to me is, I, that's br brilliant, spot on. I, I've got no problem with that. That's just words. Uh, and of course, the Quran was uh, lived by the Prophet ﷺ. The other side of that coin or that, that, that argument, which I would have a problem with, is um, it's a bit like what you referred to earlier in saying that the sunnah or part of it supersedes or qadiyah, it judges over the Qur'an. Um, so, for example, there's a verse in the Qur'an that la ikrah fi deen. There is no compulsion regarding the theme. Now, that would mean that an apostate cannot be killed based on just faith. I'm not talking about siyasa sharia, which the scholars use as principles of, of basically political fiqh, where they will say that, oh, this person may be uh, a traitor, he may be a threat, this may be he's going to conspire with the enemy states, and that's more a political ruling. But as far as pure Iman is concerned, just Iman, we're not talking about any of the threats. This, just by a person saying that, look, I don't want to believe in God. Uh, Allah in the Quran, in all honesty, Allah is not in need of this person's Iman. This person is in need of Allah. Exactly. So we, we it is a sense of arrogance on our part as human beings that thinking that God needs us. So... Allah says in the Quran, man yu'min, man yakfur. You know, hey, look, I've is your consciousness enough not a sign that wow, something bigger than you exists? And 
And if you want to believe, فليتقدم. If you don't, it's up to you. You know, Allah is not in need. So if a person was to say that, look, I, and Allah says in the Quran, لا إكراه في الدين. We're not going to. What kind of an iman I, it, is it if we were to force somebody to believe? It is an insult. You know, what kind of a faith? Like if I had to force someone to say thank you to me, like I have to force you, that is insulting to me. Like I have to force somebody to say thank you. Uh, that's not gratitude. So the Quran is clear. Now, if somebody said, well, okay, we've got that ruling in the Quran, but there is an, I'm going to take a hadith and overrule the Quran now and say, you see, now this is a problem. This kind of saying that the hadith will overrule, overshadow the Qur'an, this is uh, misplaced. Uh, this is, even if it's coming from a sheer uh, love for the tradition, it is a misplaced love. Because the Qur'an can never, never be misplaced. The Qur'an can never be inaccurate and wrong in that sense where we're saying, well, the Qur'an kind of needs a bit of correcting here. No, that's... that's as Muslims, we would never say that. So this, so that's where I stand with this. So there's one side of saying that the Sunnah is with the Quran, which is perfectly, I've got no problem, which is a descriptive uh, side in giving description about speaking about Salah, speaking about how do you do Hajj. Or Allah says in the Quran, for example, he commands justice or he commands, let's say, uh, Ihsan. And you've got you know many beautiful hadiths of the Prophet showing by his character Ihsan, he's being kind to me. So that side, I'm absolutely, I celebrate it. Uh, this view, uh, I find it disturbing that we would overrule the Quran. And that is the understanding, by the way, in principle at least, in principle of the Hanafi Madhab and also the Maliki Madhab as well. Yeah, not yeah. Not only that, it goes even further than that. Uh, there, according to Taha Jabir Rawani, Imam Al Karhi, who was a Hanafi scholar, even yeah. went so far as to declare that if anything that we say contradicts the Quran or the Sunnah, the, then the Quran or the Sunnah should be considered abrogated. In other words, <laughs> no, no. I have actually read that uh, yeah. from the Kalam of uh, Imam Al Karhi. <laughs> so now. So now the, the ulama become basically the highest authority. And I remember when I was giving a class, an uh, English class, to a group of professionals from one of the major conglomerates here in Malaysia, we sometimes would discuss a little bit about Islam, and I said something to uh, something uh, about the ulama and one of the my students. An otherwise bright sister uh, said to, objected and said to me, but Mr. Abdul Karim, the ulama are the highest authority. So when I heard that, I paused briefly and I said, Sister, in Islam, the highest authority is Allah to Allah. Please don't confuse the two. The highest authority is Allah. There is no one above Allah. So, and in fact, uh, the Shafi Mazhab, the traditional ranking of the roots of the Sharia, does place, in fact, the Quran in the top place, mm -hmm. followed by the Sunnah, followed by the Ijma, and then by Ijtihad and what have you. So, but I agree, and I'm not alone, we are not alone here, brother, that placing the Sunnah above the Quran, and there's another saying which is popular among the exegetes, which is that the uh, Quran needs the Sunnah more than the Sunnah needs the Quran. This is another way of prioritizing the Sunnah over the Quran, in addition to the statement that the Sunnah judges or explains the Quran. Because the moment you put the Sunnah in a position of a judge of the Quran, you are placing the Sunnah above the Quran. And is that right? And there are people, uh, uh, writers, including Shahrur, and I believe uh, Alwani also points this out, this is not right. We cannot reverse the relationship between the Quran and the Sunnah in this way. Mm. We have would, to yeah, would you feel the way I had said in response to that, would you, uh, because I had said it in one aspect, were it simply descriptive and just uh, explanatory? It's just saying, well, I know somebody could argue everything is explanatory, but where it's in detail, so where, where you have something like Mujmal, 
and then you have mufassal so Allah is saying aqimu salah but the prophet is showing you how to do the salah or uh, Allah is saying you know atimul umrata wal hajj and the prophet is saying you know these are the manasik follow me and I'll show you in this sense it's it's not this you wouldn't have would you have an issue you wouldn't have an issue with that side it's just the other or would you with both well actually to be quite frank brother i'm still trying to work this out mm -hmm. and it's not an easy no, uh, sure. issue to come to grips with but i i am reminded of the verses in the quran uh, which the Qurani people are fond of pointing out, out that a the Quran is a clear book, Haza Kitab or Mubin. Another verse which says we have this is a complete book. We have left out nothing out of this book. And it explains things in detail, you see. Mm -hmm. So and then to assert, as some uh, ulama have asserted, that the Quran contains unclear verses or ambiguous verses, I find somewhat problematic because the Quran says, after all, that it is a clear book. Are we supposed to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed some unclear verses to us that somehow on the day that he revealed certain verses, he felt a little bit blurred? And therefore that he needs a little help. He who is above all needs, am I supposed to believe that he now needs a little help from his own creatures, from his own servants to help him make himself clear? Because God, that is what traditional yeah. exegesis is telling God, us, bro. God forbid, yeah. I mean, to be fair, though, uh, Professor, no Muslim, just to be clear, would really ever say that God felt blurred or anything or was... Uh, and what, uh, what? just to be clear for the viewers, that's just, an, you know, just trying to say by... Ad absurdum, one could say something like this. But what would you th then say about, people would say, well, the verses that say, Allah says, from the book are those verses which are muhkamat wa ukhar. There are other verses, mutashabihat, so that which can can have multiplicity. They can have tashabuh. And I, I wonder how how would you see, what is that referring to? Well, first of all, I think that uh, the rendition of Mutashabihat as ambiguous is incorrect. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have even seen Leslie Hazelton, who is otherwise a very knowledgeable woman. Uh, she has some interesting videos uh, what's, on YouTube. What's her name? Leslie? Les Leslie Hazelton. Hazelton. That's L E S L E Y. Uh, she was actually, I think, on Edip, one of Edip's uh, videos. He interviews her. Hazelton, that's H A Z L E T O N. And she gives a TED talk also very brilliant about the Quran. But she makes this one uh, error, which is to render the word uh, mutashabihad as, as ambiguous. You see, the, act, the, the word mutashabihad actually means allegorical. Uh, Tashabahad kulubuhum means their hearts are similar, it implies similarity. Mm. And by the way, in ordinary communication, the, a simile or a metaphor or an allegory is typically used to make something that is unclear more clear. You know what I'm saying? But of mm. course, the mutashabihad can be interpreted more, more than one way, like the expression, the face of Allah can be interpreted literally or metaphorically. Yeah. And Allah, of course, advises us not to pursue these, uh, you know, uh, these metaphorical uh, words because it is the people who have uh, somehow a perversion in the hearts that, uh, you know, follow, uh, try to follow these particular verses. So I personally believe that there are no unclear verses in the Quran because Allah cannot be unclear. That is my that is my take on it. Uh, but please correct me if I'm missing no, something. I, I, I think everybody, you know, this is why I'm curious to see your understanding the way. I would similarly, I would uh, understand this verse where you mentioned Mutashabihat um, uh, as allegorical. What I would understand, I wouldn't restrict it to just verses to do with descriptions of God, although that may be from it. I would say that there, what the Quran is teaching us is that revelation as a whole, um, it has the nature of revelation, like the ontological, the essence of revelation, of scripture, Allah is saying that there are verses that, that are there, parts of it that have come very clear with a very clear, precise message. That is the Ummul Kitab, the nectar. This is the core of scripture. But revelation and scripture by its nature will have a dynamism to it. Because human beings are dynamic and 
that dynamism, there will be elements that have an agility, a flexibility to it. Because um, like you mentioned, they can be allegorical. They can be kind of stretched. They can be because human beings are like that with our own existence, our tabi'a. So some people may use revelation at certain times to manipulate it. And those are people that have a disease in their hearts because they, they are not doing this with a righteous cause. They're manipulating it. And so I this is how I would understand that. Um, so people can at times manipulate. If they had a ill intent, they could misuse scripture and revelation and cause harm with it. But otherwise, the words of God would never, you know, the, the, the words of God are a mercy. But people, because they are crooked, they can manipulate stuff. That's how I kind of see that verse. Um, yeah. So, okay, I wanted to to unpack a bit of um, the abrogation uh, topic. But before that, uh, just, just two key things. One, just a little statement, because we've spoken a lot about hadith. Uh, but... Uh, and the other was just a question I wanted to ask that because we've mentioned Dr. Edip and I've had uh, Dr. Edip on and we've spoken about <coughs> the Quran, Quranist movement. Uh, that was a question that people may have that do you identify with the Quranist, Quran only movement or is it just you're sympathetic to them or um, because people may have a curiosity. I know Dr. Edip was very passionate about his kind of stance when I had him on on the show um so that's a a question but b before you answer that i just wanted to make a little statement since we've spoken about hadith that is that um i've said this before and i've said this uh many times just this is just for the viewers that look um what are i uh, and uh, and you can comment on this as well professor as, as i finish with this that uh what i do not advocate and i actually argue against um, is that please do not use these words, these discussions, these uh, this discourse to spew hatred, okay? Um, because I have found on certain, I've even, I've bought a book as well. Uh, I bought a few books, but there was uh, a book I bought by somebody who was just really, because it said it was a discussion on Bukhari, but he was just spewing so much hatred, and and the whole book is in Arabic. It's called Jinayatul Bukhari, you know, the crimes of Bukhari, and it's just spewing so much hatred. Um, using obviously, he's not using from; he's already published in Arabic. But I mean, just say sometimes I've seen people will hear some, learn certain things, and they use it to further an agenda of of a problem that's within them, like there's something. There's some turbulence in them. There's some kind of hate and they're projecting it. This is to this is a serious discussion. And this is a discussion about really something that is so important to the hearts of many of us, faith, and how we deal with it. And many people that do struggle, like they see certain hadith and it problematizes their faith. In fact, just today I was, uh, or yesterday, I was just responding to a message uh, from somebody from America, New York, who, who was just, bothered about so disturbed by the same thing and i would say that look this you have to understand that when you do that you make everything so much worse obviously apart from just spewing hatred you ruin the dialogue because then people don't engage you have to understand that look people feel that a discussion like this is an attack on the tradition so they get all defensive and they get defensive because in their hearts, they also have a love for the tradition. Now, we may argue that is a misplaced in this place because we're not trying to attack the tradition. We're just trying to say that, look, let's accept human margins like other ulama have for error and safeguard the iman of many people. But when other people come into this discussion and start spewing hatred, start saying, oh, you know, this guy, Imam Bukhari, let's swear at Imam Bukhari or let's... Uh, this kind of stuff, this is not befitting. So I just wanted to clarify that I think it's really important. And 
I do, even if it's, you know, and I would advocate people, even if it's for the human endeavor, the ulama or the people, they have like the tradition. It is a rich tradition. Um, it's not a perfect tradition. It's a human tradition, but it is a rich, like people have spent lives and, you know, they weren't, they weren't people trying to be criminals or spew or do, you know, like Imam, if somebody may say, I disagree with Imam Shafi'i's view of things, he spent an entire life doing something. So the, there's credit to what a, an Imam has been doing, even if you disagree with their views. But that was really important because this discussion, I think it gets a lot of juices flowing, Professor, with people and a lot of energy and, and people sometimes get all heated and, and I hear things and people start typing things and they start insulting Let's swear at this imam and let's swear. And none, this is not from Islam. And it just ruins things. And if there's compassion, you can actually get somewhere in a dialogue. You know, you think, child, I, I see this person's coming. Okay, you know, he, he too cares for this. But okay, this is his angle. Let me try and talk, have a dialogue. But sorry, uh, Professor, that, that's why I said that. But coming back to you. Um, if you've got some thoughts on that, the other question, if, if you'd like to answer it, if you'd like to leave it, that's fine. And then I'd like to unpack a bit on abrogation. Sure. Well, in relation to this hatred, absolutely, you are absolutely right. In fact, I'm reminded of the verse in our Quran, Surah 16, verse 125, which says that we should speak to people in the best possible manner. Um, and yeah. And I have, in fact, included this quotation in my first book, uh, Reflections. And I remember when I showed it to Sheikh Imran Hossein, who's actually a friend of mine, he okay. was absorbed by, by that. I and would love to get him on here if, he's ever, if he ever agrees to it. <laughs> well, I don't see why not. He's a, quite a reasonable uh, chap. Uh, you know, I'm sure that he would, uh, you know, uh, have some interesting things to say. He's yeah. got quite a large following here he in does. Malaysia. And he draws big crowds whenever he gives a, gives a talk here. And in fact, being on a subject, I remember asking him one time this question. Sheikh, uh, what is the relationship between the Quran and Sunnah? We were walking to some place, maybe I mean, to give a talk or to listen to a talk. And as we are walking, he thought about it for a while. And then he gave me this answer. He said, and I'm quoting pretty close to verbatim, he said, the Quran is absolutely authoritative. And then he added, but the Sunnah is conditionally authoritative. And that was the end of his answer. It's My a very interpretation. Profound answer. Wow. Yeah, it's, it yeah. seems to make sense. In other words, we need to subordinate the Sunnah to the Quran, not the other way around. But what mm -hmm. seems to have happened for some people is that they have, uh, some people appear to have subordinated the, the Quran to the Sunnah. And in fact, Taja Birawani says in his book, uh, an article on uh, the uh, abrogation, in fact, that we need to come up with a methodology whereby the Sunnah can be subordinated to the Quran. I'm paraphrasing once again, but you can find the exact verbatim uh, words in it in his paper, which you can find on academia. Now, in terms of the other question, whether I am a Qurani person or no, I would suggest to the viewers, if you want to know my position, please look at my writing. I have tried to articulate it in a way that I don't have to go back to it and redo it or uh, improve it, although I have already found myself uh, doing exactly that a few times. The nice thing about publishing on Amazon is that you can very easily replace your manuscript. If you have an updated version, you just post it again and uh, wow. it automatically replaces the document that is already there wow. with the new one. So I have found myself, from, I do find myself from time to time, I read over the book description to one of my books and I said to myself, oh, my goodness, I cannot put it like that. I have to redo this. So I go back to the drawing board, redo it, and I repost it again. So it's an ongoing process. But in terms of your question, whether I'm a, you know, a Qurani person, of course, I believe the Quran is the top authority. The Sunnah should be in agreement. And I also believe that Islamic law should be based on the Quran. I, I have to confess to that. Why? Because I'm disturbed by the fact that death penalty for apostasy was included in the Sharia, despite the fact that the Hadith on which it is based is a solitary Hadith. It has uh, uh, problems with logic because it says whoever changes his religion, kill him. That that means you would have to kill me too because I changed my religion when I, when I 
I became a Muslim. And also, I understand that uh, Ibn Abbas, to whom this tradition goes, was apparently only 13 years old when he reportedly heard the Prophet, peace be on him, say that. Uh, the tradition. And it's, it's also the transmission from, um, from Ikrama. Ikrima, yes. Uh, who was uh, also, it supports an ideology which was, he was part of the kind of uh, the Khwarij uh, ideology, which was an extremist where people, they would also, or at least some elements of factions of the Khwarij would kill people if they committed sins and other things. So, yeah, so this hadith clearly conflicts with the Quran. It conflicts with like Rahavidin plus with the other verse that you cited already. Whoever wants to believe, let him, and whoever wants to disbelieve, let him. There is no compulsion in religion. And when we try to force someone to become uh, pious, we are actually also violating that person's dignity. And Allah said in the Quran, we have bestowed dignity on the children of Adam. Yeah. So we should not violate people uh, by forcing them. It's a, a sort of, a, you know, uh, forcing people to do things is, is very bad. I mean, uh, look, uh, I mean, I don't know whether this is an appropriate analogy, but, you know, we have uh, this instance of rape when women are forced into sex when they are raped, right? Now, what about forcing people to believe something? Can we think of it as a kind of intellectual rape? I know this is very strong words, but uh, this is what I'm trying to it say. Is, it is not, you see, Iman, forced faith is unacceptable. Yeah, it breeds like Allah does not... It does not, uh, that, that, that is, it's not faith. It's not faith. It's not, you can't say, I, I force you to believe in God. It basically just means lip service, isn't it? It doesn't mean exactly. it, there is no iman. If I said to you right now, you better say you believe in uh, Allah or I'm going to shoot you. Or if somebody said, you know, you better say that Jesus Christ is Lord or I'm going to shoot you. Naturally, you're going to say, okay. You know, sure, Jesus Christ is Lord. Can I go now, please? I mean, it's just lip service. It can never be Iman. There is no Iman and force is an oxymoron. Yeah, and as I said in a talk that I gave to the uh, academic members of our university, they asked me to give a talk because the, the scheduled speaker sort of cancelled out in the last minute. Uh, so I was asked to, to give a talk. And one of the points I mentioned was that if we are going to force people to have faith, we are going to produce hypocrites. Yeah. That is what's going to happen. How can you have sincere believers uh, as part of your group if you are going to force people? Yeah. And in fact, it reminds me of a discussion I had with the acting dean of the Quran and Sunnah faculty one time at the same university, where I told him that uh, why are Muslims so uh, concerned about, you know, killing apostates? Just let them go. You know, the, uh, the Muslim community will be strong without such people. And he gave me an interesting answer. He said, you know, Brother Abdul Karim, that is exactly what Sheikh uh, Tantawi said when he was visiting us some time ago. He said, because there's even a verse in our Quran where the Prophet was, uh, peace be on him, was concerned that some people didn't want to join him in a particular battle. And Allah responds by saying, don't worry about it. Let them go. You will be stronger without them. And I believe this is true. A smaller number of committed people is stronger than a larger number of people who are not so committed and in fact may be hesitating in their uh, decisiveness and their firmness. You know, during the war, Second World War, uh, between, uh, when the, Ra the Russians were, you know, the, there was this directive that you couldn't say anything uh, like, just for saying something like, oh, the Germans have so many planes. If you said that among the Russian soldiers who were on the brink of defeat and on the brink of demoralization, you could be shot, martial court, and be shot for demoralizing the troops around you. That's how seriously they took it. So you had to be uh, positive and not to create doubt among the fellow soldiers that could lead to the loss of the war due to demoralization. So I, I totally agree that you know uh, there cannot be any compulsion in religion, and this hadith was anyway made part of the uh, deen for political reasons to maintain unity among the Muslims. And, and this is not a hidden thing. So you see, for example, the especially the Hanafi mother, which is very vocal about this, uh, Imam Sarakhsi and other people write very clearly, it was very early on, we're talking over a thousand years ago, they write that, you see, the ruling for the murtad, the apostate, that they say this penalty applies to, they say it doesn't apply to the woman apostate, the female apostate, because she is not a threat. 
So, uh, so because the question was that what was it they were afraid of? It wasn't a it wasn't a a, a theological threat. They weren't afraid of a, the a theological kind of element. They were afraid that the man was going to become this renegade, and because he knew where the Muslims live and he knew which gates could be easily breached, and he now leaves the community. You see, and the hadith they use mufariqun lil jama'a, like he leaves the community. He's going to spread insider secrets. And in, in the olden days, the towns and cities were inside these walls and inside they had the gates and they had weak spots and they knew. So this was the threat. And they felt that, well, the woman, what, how is she going to be a threat to us? So this is why they say that, oh, no, OK, the woman, you can imprison her, but you can't. They said that she doesn't have a death penalty because the whole point back then was it was political. It was about politics, military, about breach of general safety. It was about it, it was about basically potential terror for for all the inhabitants. That's what it was. It was never about your iman to God. What why would it because whether a person chose not to believe his loss. You know, a person says, look, it's like people say today, oh, you know, I don't believe that nothing makes sense. No, oh, fine. That's that's okay, it's your way. Of looking at, at the, why would that bother me? Why does that bother my faith? Hmm. Yeah, I think what happened there was a confusion of apostasy with treason. Treason, yes, is a crime and should be punishable severely because, like you said, a treasonous individual can bring down a whole community by opening a door to let the enemy in. We heard of the Trojan horse thing and whatnot. But um, for leaving the religion alone, and I think this is how quite a number of people explain this, but they should be stated clearly that the death penalty here is not for apostasy, it is for treason. Yeah. That would seem to me to make more sense. But uh, the other example, of course, famous example is the death penalty for uh, adultery. The Quran clearly prescribes 100 lashes for uh, zina uh, conviction based on a testimony of four reliable witnesses. And according to a former friend of mine who passed away, unfortunately already, may Allah bless his soul, mm -hmm. he was a rector of a, an Islamic university here in Malaysia. In, in fact, he was the rector of the top Muslim university in the world at the time. Wow. I don't want to mention his name to protect the privacy of his family, but he told me that in the entire um, uh, history of Islam, in 1,400 years, there has not been a single conviction of adultery based on the four witnesses. You know, so of course it's very difficult to it's prove very a crime. Of... Yeah, because, exactly. Because How they many... say they have to witness actual penetration, like all four. You can't just even see the man on top of the woman. You have to all yeah. have the exact angle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and how many people will do this kind of a thing in public where where, where they can they can be witnessed? Of course not. But the fact that the uh, the penalty of 100 lashes was abrogated and replaced by the penalty specified in the Hadith shows to us an example of where the words of human being actually overruled the words of Allah. And that is very problematic. Please correct me if I'm missing something. Yeah, no, I, I I agree with you that this primacy of the uh, of the Quran, the centrality of the Quran in Islam, it is the backbone. It is the central nervous system of our faith as an organism. That without it, there is no faith, and it is it is it is always going to be number one. And that is, to be fair, traditional. Islam, according to at least the Maliki school and the Hanafi school, although I do accept throughout the centuries what um, some, um, what you have, uh, Professor from, uh, I was, uh, I was about to, uh, it's on the tip of my tongue, the Professor from the States, but what he, what he had called was the Shafization process, um, where about 7th century, seven, about 700 years in, you start to get a lot of the other majority of the ulama seem to shift towards the way the muhaddithin, which were mainly Shafi'i, a lot of them were Shafi'i in the, in the Near East, they see things. So even though they were in in their roots Hanafi or in their roots Maliki, um, they started to kind of shift their outlook towards this. And this is the canonization of uh, the Sahihain also kind of begins. Uh, but yeah, so... Following on from that, the, the what we were saying about uh, abrogation, 
this is an, I, I mean, a lot of people ask this, and I know you've got some writing on this and you've got some discussions on it and you've got some videos as well on YouTube. So, yeah, I mean, I'd love for you to share your thoughts uh, on that, where you stand with it. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I also have six videos on abrogation on academia, however, about 15 minutes each. However, these videos are accessible only to the premium subscribers, so uh, you would have to be a premium subscriber to access them. On what? Sorry, however, on YouTube? On abrogation. Abrogation, no, on academia. Oh, which academia. Is an, oh, right. Yeah, they have introduced this new policy. Well, can, of wait a minute, you can put videos on academia? Oh, absolutely. Serious? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All this time, what have I been doing? Okay. Yeah, you should put your videos. And by the way, brother, you can get paid for it. Actually, I got, yeah, actually, I got paid for these particular videos. Oh, wow. Uh, I won't, you know, raise I a key like from it. <laughs> Long live capitalism, people. Long yeah, live. exactly. So, um, in fact, uh, they approached me to do this uh, course. They call them courses. Be they saw my short video on abrogation, which is also on YouTube. And they said, hey, we like your video. How would you like to do a course on it? So, okay, there it is. But since they paid me for it, now I don't feel justified in putting those same videos on YouTube because I think they got sort of like exclusive rights to them. If they hadn't paid me for it, then no problem. The other set of videos I posted on Academia, for which they did not pay me, and that uh, and that's why I felt at liberty to post them on YouTube, are the videos on the uh, evolution of political Islam or the genealogy of political Islam, as, as I put it. So uh, there's um, there, there's uh, one short video on abrogation on YouTube, and uh, there are these six others on, on Academia. But like I said, it's only available to – I don't know how much they're asking for a year subscription. I don't think it's that, that high. But anyway, just to let your viewers uh, know this. Uh, and what, like, what, I'll, what I'll do as well at the end, I'll, um, I'll get your links, uh, or you can send them to me, and I'll add them to the description so people can good. find you there. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, this issue of abrogation came up while I was still at the university. Of course, I would talk to my, I was teaching English, uh, literature in English, Shakespeare in English, uh, English for special purposes, editing. I, I uh, coordinated the program uh, for a year. There was about 2,000 students in it. I had about 48 staff working for me, 16 or 18 of them, of them full time, the rest part time. It was a big job, but alhamdulillah, I managed. Yeah. So, and I even taught, I think, two or I think three courses. Anyway, it was, a, it was a, but anyway, so I would have discussions with my students from time to time and I would tell them what I read in the Quran. I said, you know, I read in the Quran that the Quran confirms the previous revelations. I told them I found uh, 20 verses in the Quran, 10 of which mention the Torah and the Angel side by side, and the other 10 say that the Quran uh, confirms what is with you already. The Arabic expression which is used is Musaddiqo lima baina yadai, which means uh, which literally means what is uh, between your hands already, meaning what is with you already, meaning the Torah and the NGO. So, uh, but my students were assuring me, uh, telling me, but Mr. Karim, uh, Mr. Abu Karim, don't you know that the Quran abrogated the previous revelations? I said, no, I don't know that. I don't. S so I was experiencing cognitive dissonance, uh, getting conflicting messages, one from the Quran and a completely opposite message from my students. So I was wondering what is going on here and who should I believe? Of course, I believe Allah uh, rather than the human beings, but what this told me. <laughs> wow. exactly. What a line. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who speaks the truth more than Allah? Who is better, you know, than Allah in speaking you, the truth? You, you go to them, you know what, I've listened to you all and you know what, and I could listen to you. I could actually agree with all of you, but you know what, I'll just go with Allah. <laughs> of course, I mean, Allah says, in Allah, you people mutawakilin. Allah loves those who put their trust in Him. And nothing against the Sahaba or whatnot, but as I mentioned in one of the com uh, comments on one of my clubhouse room discussions, Allah does not say that He loves those who put their trust in the Sahaba, with all due respect to the Sahaba. We have to love, put our trust in Allah, because that trust will never be, uh, you know, betrayed. And whoever holds on to the teaching of Allah has taken hold of a strong handhold, you know, and we must hold on to the rope that Allah extends to us. So if we if we compromise on that, we could be facing serious difficulties. I was but going to say that there was a there's a joke that they transmit in the in the books. Like you know in the past when the Muslims would always argue with each other and take digs and 
especially the Hanafis and Shafi'is would with each other all the time. So what happened is uh, on a particular uh, incident, they, they, some person, they had a gathering, a mixed gathering, some Shafi'is and Hanafis, and they were taking digs at each other. So they were saying, well, you know, this, oh, well, there's ikhtilaf between you guys and the Prophet. So one of them had got up and he had cited a mas'ala. And he said, well, this is the mas'ala. And he said, but there's ikhtilaf in it. He said, there's walakin fi khilaf. He said, fi khilaf bayna <laughs> between Allah and Imam Abu Hanifa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting way of putting it. Yeah. That is so out of order. Yeah. So I, I remember when my, you know, our teachers told us that in Torah Hadith, when we were studying Hadith in Pakistan in the Madrasa, oh my God, I fell over laughing. And it sounds so hilarious in Arabic. It's like, what the hell? It's like saying, yeah, there's a difference of opinion in this between God and him. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, of course, yeah, right. <laughs> Disputing <Sorry>. with Allah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, but sorry, yeah. Coming back to yeah. So yeah, okay, so, so abrogation. You're saying so currently you're describing the abrogation between the Quran and prior scriptures. Is this is that, what you mean by abrogation? Well, no, actually, there's more to it than that. Mm -hmm. uh, abrogation takes many forms. That's mm -hmm. one form of abrogation. I think it's traceable to Ibn Kathir, who allegedly claimed that uh, the Quran abrogates the previous revelations, which I think is uh, an incorrect point of view because it runs directly in the face of the, what the Quran says in no fewer than 20 verses. But of course, there's another, the problem with abrogation extends beyond that because another form of abrogation we have is the abrogation of the Quran by the Quran. And here some of the uh, ulama have claimed, according to Muhammad Ghazali, that a single verse in Al-Quran, verse number five, uh, surah number nine, the famous verse which is quoted out of context, of course, kill them wherever you find them. Mm -hmm. According to Muhammad Ghazali, uh, some ulama took the point of view that this verse abrogated no fewer than 120 of the so-called uh, 120 verses in the Quran and all these verses that were allegedly abrogated by the so-called verse of the sword, all of these abrogated verses were uh, verses that are considered as uh, verses counseling reconciliation and peace. In short, they are known as the peace verses. So uh, Muhammad Ghazali expresses shock on this, and I have a quotation from him. You can also find it online. He calls the, uh, the, this idea that a solitary verse abrogated 120 uh, peace verses, and I think he refers to the entire doctrine of abrogation as, uh, and these are strong words, and but I will repeat them because they are his words. He calls it, I quote, crassest stupidity, end of quote. So he totally rejects it. Who's, who's and, saying that, sorry? Uh, Muhammad word. Ghazali. Muhammad Ghazali, Muhammad Ghazali. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. recently, yes. Okay. Yeah, and um, uh, by the way, there are a number of contemporary writers who also reject the doctrine of abrogation. Let me mention a few names. Muhammad Asad rejects it utterly in his commentary on uh, the verse 106 in Surah Al-Baqarah, which is normally uh, the word uh, Nasakhist, uh, typically rendered as abrogate. But mm -hmm. as actually my former uh, boss points out in his jurisprudence book, the, verse, uh, the word Nasakh in Arabic has a second meaning, which is to transcribe uh, or copy from from one place to another. So the, uh, the uh, Quran could be uh, the so-called abrogation of the uh, previous revelation could be interpreted by saying that actually the Quran does not abrogate the pre previous revelations, but rather gives us a kind of a transcript or, uh, you know, a reiteration of the teaching of the previous revelations. And also Abu Muslim al-Isfahani rejected the yeah. doctrine of Abu on the uh, basis of the three verses in the Quran where Allah says that we will never find a change in the words of Allah. So that alone should put paid to the whole discussion about abrogation. Are we supposed to believe, as Muhammad Asad points out, that Allah somehow uh, revealed some verses and then he said, okay, excuse me, guys, I didn't mean that. Here's what I really meant. Allah is not like that. He doesn't have to correct himself. And besides, the moment you accept the doctrine of abrogation that the Quranic verse abrogates other Quranic verses, you are actually questioning the perfection of the Quran and its inimitability. You are saying that there is a flaw in the Quran because if there was no flaw in the Quran, there would be no need for abrogation. 
So this whole doctrine is very problematic. And some of the other people that reject the doctrine of abrogation include Ismail Faruqi, they include Rashid Ridai, they include Muhammad Abdu, they include even Said Qutb rejected it, they include uh, Taj Abir al-Wani, and I think I think I've got most of them. But most of the modern commentators basically reject this doctrine as uh, without foundation. And there's in fact a, a fellow from Oxford University Press, He, he's, I think his name is Blankenship, he also writes right yes I've, I've heard of him yeah yeah that the, the in the early days yes there was some support for the doctrine of abrogation and in by the way Taj Abir al-Wani points out that the doctrine of abrogation was uh, of the uh, was already uh, accepted by the ulama and this is was not a minority opinion it was accepted by the majority of the ulama as early as 660 AD which is less than 30 years after the demise of the prophet and the the form in which the doctrine of abrogation was accepted was uh, that a solitary hadith could abrogate a Quranic verse right mm -hmm. this is this is astonishing how can a solitary hadith abrogate a Quranic verse and this was the mainstream position at the time. And not only that, the ulama, the exegetes went further and they said anyone who does not believe this doctrine of abrogation has actually left the fold of Islam and has to be killed as an apostate. So mm. what is going on here? Are they enforcing orthodoxy on people by threatening to kill people? I'll be blunt about it. Is this so, the way to uh, ma maintain the unity of the ummah? Of course not. I mean, I, I don't believe in any kind of forced beliefs at all. And I find it actually, uh, you know, insulting to human dignity, like you mentioned, that human, any kind of forced belief is, is, is really just an insult, <laughs> any kind of forced belief. But uh, so, OK, just to uh, unpack that slightly. So, you know, Verses like La taqrabu salata wa antum sukara don't approach salah whilst you're drunk. Um, how would what's your response to verses like this or when about let's say alcohol? Let's take that as an example because it's a very commonly used uh, verse to demonstrate the incremental development of abrogation in the ruling of alcohol. So okay. Yeah, the Quran says, Yeah, you have Latina Amanu Lata Korobus Lata Vantum Sukara Hatta Taklamun Mata Kulun. Yes, uh, do not, uh, all you who believe do not approach prayer or pr uh, do not pray uh, while you are drunk until you know what you say. So, in fact, I use this verse to show that it is very important to know what we say when we recite the Quran because I noticed that um, not a few Muslims uh, are able to recite the Quran beautifully but without really understanding very much of what they are reciting. And a number of Muslim brothers and told me this uh, directly that, Mr. Abdul Karim, I know how to recite the Quran but I don't understand what I'm reciting. So, but this verse is normally used to say that uh, uh, the ruling uh, of uh, that there was abrogation going on, meaning that initially it was permissible to uh, to uh, consume alcohol, but later this was abrogated uh, with the verse which says that uh, yes, there's some good and evil in uh, you know the alcohol and even gambling, but let's focus on alcohol. Yeah. But the evil of it is greater than than the good. It was a kind of cost-benefit analysis, and, he, and so we are strongly discouraged from consuming alcohol uh, and uh, even uh, on rational grounds we know what happens to people when they go uh, driving in a drunken condition they can kill other people or themselves and cause incredible harm and that of course can extend to substance abuse uh, uh, you know other substances can be used but how would I put this? To me, that was not really a case of abrogation. You know, I think this ulama have this concept of specification. Uh, Taxis, I think, is the Arabic mm -hmm. term. Mm -hmm. So that was more of a case of a specification rather than abrogation. <clears throat> and I don't know whether I should add this. I don't want to, uh, you know, how do I put this? Um, normally, when there's a prohibition, uh, the Allah says something like, Hurimat alaikum. Prohibited mm -hmm. for you is this. But do you find this expression in a reference to drinking, you see? So was it uh, the Allah who prohibited the consumption or was it the ulama who prohibited it, who went a step further and declared an outright prohibition? Because there are people who are actually argue that the Quran does not explicitly prohibit. It strongly discourages. In other words, it makes it makru, undesirable, rather than haram. You see, and this is a problem, you know, that we have uh, in jurisprudence is that sometimes the, the criminalization of sin, for example, 
that we have uh, uh, actions which are declared as haram or illegal even, even though they are uh, they should be only be declared as uh, makru. I wrote a paper on uh, this concept of uh, halvat, close proximity, which is an example mm. of that. Are you aware that in Sudan, and I have an article on this in, in the New Straits Times, which is Malaysia's newspaper, in Sudan, uh, you know, th there was a law that was passed one time that um, they actually invented a new crime. And what was this new crime? Yeah. The new crime, the crime was attempted illegal sexual intercourse. Attempted illegal uh, Attempt sexual intercourse. Attempt, yes. So now, <laughs> as in, as in, <laughs> they now, forgot forgot Viagra at home, and <laughs> it was so like now, a, now, consider what was the evidence. It was for, an attempt, Your Honor. Yeah. It was just yeah. an attempt. It was a, a <laughs> exactly. miserably, abysmally failed attempt. <laughs> yeah. So now, but what was the evidence? Lack of communication for, between yeah. the. <laughs> yeah. So, but what was the evidence for this that could get you convicted? If I spoke. To a woman who was not my relative or my uh, wife or, uh, uh, you know, at a bus stop in a public space, then I would have provided evidence that I have committed this crime of attempted illegal sexual intercourse. Is I'm not joking. Is this for real? This is yeah, uh, for okay. real. So that, any kind have, of contact with the opposite yeah. gender that is not related and it could be... Some kind Very of flirtatious. Much. I take it it's yeah, flirtatious correct. behavior. Yeah, correct. Yeah, and I, and I remember. I remember one time. So I how are people supposed to get married and stuff? And it beats beats me, but I was really. <laughs> <laughs> but no was... flirtatious behavior. No, one must. <laughs> You know, it also reminds me of an experience I had. Uh, you know, I have had quite a number of students over the five years that I spent at the Islamic University. So I remember meeting one of them one time at a talk by a leading Muslim intellectual here, an economist. And so she was there sitting maybe five or six meters from me. So we recognized each other. So I said hello to her. Hi, how was how life and whatnot? Small talk. And suddenly I get this glare from a fellow uh, sitting next to her as if I was committing some kind of a horrible crime. And um, how do I put this? I think maybe he was interpreting my talking to this young lady as an attempt to seduce her, which is was totally ridiculous. And I had similar experiences at the university. I would from time to time stop by and maybe exchange a few words with a female member of the staff, you know, discuss something like... Hey, not in, not in, <laughs> Professor. <laughs> <laughs> professor yeah. exchanging some pleasant words. <laughs> always well, no, always usually, in the staff room with the female usually, staff. Usually something... <laughs> Research. In <laughs> Something intellectual, <laughs> brother. I was already married, but anyway, oh, intellectual. And I grew up in I was uh, grew up in Canada, you know. And uh, you probably know what it's like in England, you know. Uh, this is so. Anyway, I would stop by and discuss some issue. Like for instance, I I remember discussing one time with one of the ladies and about this hadith where the prophet allegedly wanted to burn some down somebody's house, and she told me, well, you know, that hadith is only meant to discourage people from not going to the Friday prayer, you know. But as I'm talking. Talking to this young lady, suddenly another colleague of mine comes uh, along, uh, a male, and I get this really knowing look from him as if I had some kind of a hidden agenda mm. that was uh, quite obvious to him. You know, I was really shocked. To me, that kind of behavior struck me as incredibly immature. Why, yeah. why do they assume that I have this, that somehow I cannot talk to a female without having some secret agenda beyond my sleeve, beyond, up my sleeve? And also, I, I think immature, but also insecure as yeah, well. True. Like this, and because you see, that, that's I, I, I take it a whole different discussion, and you know, maybe someday to unpack that. It is perfectly natural to find attraction and to have, you see, some levels of, I, I mean, there's like outrageous flirtation, but some low level of, let's say, flirtatious kind of. Uh, dynamics within a conversation is very natural. It's part of the the general natural fabric of society. It doesn't, you see, to 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 divorce that from communication, it it doesn't, you, it just doesn't add up. Like it's not always, it's it's not, it's it's very benign. It's not like a malignant kind of very evil, lustful. It's not like that. It's just how people, for example, are charming. Some people they charm people. People do it. Amongst the same gender, they'll do it with the opposite gender. People will will charm. They'll they'll be flirty. They'll... 
obviously with the opposite it'll, it'll kind of it'll be a bit detected but it's not it doesn't mean it's something that oh my god this is part and parcel of human societies it's since time has existed with people this has existed so yeah but that's a whole different a psychology discussion on a, uh, on another day but so on abrogation before just i wanted to ask this so um so, so when would you so would you stand to say or is it work in progress maybe you're still arriving at it would you say there is the the concept of abrogation so okay two questions i'd i'd like to one is there would you feel, regardless of what, which is the specifics, I, I'm not going to ask like which, unless you want to say which specific ayah uh, or which, for example, verse or because people have disagreed. You know, I think Jalal al-Din says, I think there's 20 abrogated verses. Somebody said there's five. Some people say there's a few hundred. And some, as Shatabi explains, like you mentioned, you know, when they say the word nasq, they just mean a specification. You're, you're just doing taqsis or taqid. And they call that nasq. But uh, would you feel that there is any abrogation at all? Like, does it exist in the Quran? Or as far as you're concerned currently, no, it doesn't. And two, a greater question. Do you feel the tool of abrogation exists within Islam? Um, so the, the, so and that more importantly. So, yeah, your thoughts on that, Professor? Yes, actually, I have to admit that I will have to tweak my views on abrogations a little bit, abrogation a little bit, because I realized, I think reading actually Muhammad Shahrur's book, he points out that, yes, there's some abrogation taking place in Islam. And he gives the example, for instance, of Isa alayhi salam, when he said that uh, I have come to make some things halal for you that previously were haram for you, and something also similar uh, in Judaism, you know, the, the followers of the Torah. So I think I have to to accept the position as yes, some minor abrogation yes there is uh, such a thing as going on My, but minor i emphasize but so, not nothing yeah, so, go ahead. so here's where where i'm at with it because you see <clears throat> i genuinely i thought that right uh, when i looked a bit at this discussion a little while back a few years back i felt right i can see what you're saying that look uh that many of what the verses that people are saying are abrogations are just taqsis. You know, it's just kind of muqayyad. Or, and this is why some people say, well, there's only actually two verses or three verses or that are just abrogated. And um, so, okay, I can see this discussion taking place. And then I was weighing up the options that, wait a minute, does, so does abrogation, does it exist? Um so this is what where I kind of where my scale kind of preponderated towards it does exist. You see, I'm a firm believer in uh, in kind of trajectory hermeneutics that the rulings can change with the day and age, and you see, and part of that is, for example, slavery is outlawed uh, based on the maslaha. So here, it kind of this idea then tipped my scale to saying that, well, actually, abrogation is important as a tool within the Sharia of Islam. Uh, and so with maqasid, you know, the, the, the objectives of the Sharia and with trajectory hermeneutics of so slavery, for example, being outlawed, as some as the Malikis, for some of the Malikis, for example, um, Abu Qasim al-Burzuli and others about six, seven hundred years ago had argued that, in let's say, the... The, the hudud for chopping the hands off have changed because the day and age has changed according to the Maliki fiqh that they, the fatwas they gave. So, and uh, also uh, Suleiman al-Qanuni did with the Hanafi thing in the East uh, with the Ottomans. So here I saw actually, you know, abrogation as a tool is important. Um, so that's what, what kind of swayed my, um, my where, where I stand on it. So I wonder what your thoughts are with that in mind. Yeah, okay. Um, 
you see, uh, like I said, abrogation of small rulings, I would differentiate between major rulings and small rulings. Mm -hmm. Like even when the prophet, uh, when the Islam revealed, the, when it was the verse was revealed about, you know, uh, these uh, hundred lashes, apparently there were some instances of stoning, but I think if that took place, it must have taken place before the verse was revealed. So that verse about the hundred lashes in a way abrogated uh, the punishment for apostasy specified in the Torah, as we know, the Torah calls for the stoning of adulterers. But uh, on another level, when it comes to something bigger, I have, and by the way, I was just informed by Kindle uh, Amazon that my book, Tradition as Judgment in Islam has just gone live and public, so if any readers ah, is interested, now people, it's there. Do check yeah, it out, there, definitely. There you go. Yeah, so um, in terms of abrogation of something bigger, I think highly problematic, brother. And let me explain uh, what I mean. You see, it just kind of occurred to me as I was doing this research that something really big happened in Muslim, in Islamic history, in Islamic thought. And abrogation has a lot to do with it. We know that Quran presents itself as a religion of peace. Mm -hmm. But what happened when the ulama are telling us that we find ourselves in a conflict similar to the clash of civilization that Samuel Huntington has been talking about, Islam and the West or Islam and the rest, the, some of the Muslim ulama, I refer to them as the hawkish ulama, I don't want to use the word militant, maybe it's a little too strong, but the hawkish ulama are trying to convince us that we Muslims are in a state of uh, clash or conflict uh, with non-Muslims in a so-called conflict between the Darul Islam and the Darul Harb. Mm -hmm. And I remember my own former boss, uh, Muhammad Hashim Kamali, saying in one of the meetings that we had that this is not part of Islam. This doctrine of the clash of Darul Islam and Darul Harb is not part of Islam, it's not part of the teaching of the Quran. Yet some of the ulama have made it into a, uh, the jihad al-talab, which kind of follows from that, the offensive jihad, they made it into a sixth pillar of Islam, which is actually a requirement on Muslims to go to war at least once a year against the so-called people in the uh, non-Muslim world as a kind of religious requirement. And if this is not uh, fulfilled, then the caliph or whoever is the leader of the Muslim community has failed to fulfill his, uh, his, the, his, the, his uh, requirements. So I think that the abrogation of the peace verses, to me, uh, by the ver uh, verse of the sword, was an example actually of a major, major tempering, tempering with the teaching of the Quran. Because what it has essentially done, and I argue this in at least two or three of my books in different ways, what it has done or helped to do is to help to transform the religion of peace into, and I will put it bluntly, into a religion of war, brother. We all know that Islam is a religion of peace, and you can see these discussions on YouTube between Mehdi Hassan at Oxford and other people. Is Islam a religion of peace? Of course it is a religion of peace. But did the ulama or the hawkish ulama maintain it as a religion of peace? Did they not, by abrogating the peace verses, actually divest the Quran of its teaching of peace? and replace something else. There's a hadith according to which the prophet uh, said, peace be on him, that I was sent as a mer with a sword as a mercy to mankind. The word sword is mentioned in the hadith. Now that hadith sounds very similar to the Quranic verse you cited earlier, verse 107, surah 21, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Now compare the verse with the hadith. What do you see? You see a huge difference. You see a difference between Islam as a religion of peace, as taught by the Quran, and militant Islam as represented by the Hadith, and uh, this particular Hadith. And I, in fact, I have a friend, uh, he's in, somewhere in Texas in the U.S. He told me that he used to read the Dabik magazine, you know, of ISIS. Oh, the, no. the extremist, yeah. And he said to me, he said to us, 95% of the references in that magazine are all going to the Hadith. And uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi declared publicly that Islam has always been a religion of war. He, he's on record for saying that. And I have personally encountered brothers here on Clubhouse, in the Clubhouse rooms, who are telling me that we are still obligated to slay the uh, unbelievers wherever we find them. I was shocked. I told him, brother, he was in Canada, be careful, because if you go on talking like that in Canada, you might be facing jail time. Mm. You know? Yeah, I mean... 
I uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, categorically, these kind of voices are, you know, these ISIS kind of voices are an abomination to Islam and to humanity as a whole. But I, right. So just just to kind of uh, some some thoughts on w what you've said. So about the ulama and the Dar al Harb and this kind of taqsim, this kind of uh, demarcation, drawing out the the map of the world in saying these are the lands of Kufar, Kufardom, and this is Imandom. You know, like this is like Darul Kufar, Darul Islam kind of stuff. You see, I would, what I, how I see this is that that ulama speak is just an extension of the day and age. Like everybody in the world was doing that in that day and age. Like the Christians had Christendom, um, you know, they saw this as the land of the infidels. The Muslims were doing it. The Chinese kind of dynasties had it going on. Every like they were just interpreting the world through the lens of their age and using the Islamic kind of references to guide, let's say, themselves, the kings and monarchs and dynasts and whatever. Um, so I, I don't. I mean, the reason I'm saying that is I don't believe that these. I agree with you. These. Uh, labels or this kind of mapping of the world is artificial, it's arbitrary, it's not from Allah or from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it's not enshrined in Islam. Um, however, I don't think they were doing with this with some kind of an evil plot to distort Islam. I think they were just being what everybody was doing. So if you were somebody in, living in Paris under Charlemagne, you know, you'd see the world as this is Christendom and this is uh, the infidel lands. And if you're somebody in Baghdad, you'd see, well, this is Dar al-Islam and that's Dar al-Kufar. And it's it's just people speaking the language of their day and age. But I agree with you that to use those terms today when the world has changed today, we don't we're not, you know, people are not grouped into just this land. Like you and I are an example right now. I mean, OK, you're in Malaysia, but. You're from Canada and or you're from Eastern Europe and then Canada by extension. So uh, I'm here in the UK. The, it's, these labels completely are a mismatch and a misfit and inappropriate and in fact dangerous to use today. Because by extension, if we use them, the, the next step, see the moment we say this is Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Kufr, the next step is those scholars that made these titles would say, oh, it's OK to attack. Dar al-Kufr. It's okay to steal in Dar al-Kufr. It's okay to... Because they saw that as like enemy territory that was always at war. So so it has very dangerous kind of uh, conclusions if you follow them through. So um, so absolutely. I mean, I uh, agree, you know, echo those kind of sentiments. Um, yeah, I just wanted to just, just, just put that. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Yeah. And by the way, brother, I was watching one of your videos, and maybe you can confirm this, but I thought I heard you say, you were talking about Ibn Taymiyyah, you know, okay. but correct me if I'm heard correctly or not, but, and I was trying to find the reference for this uh, online, I, so far I couldn't, but now since you're in front of me, maybe I can ask you directly. If I recall correctly, you said that Ibn Taymiyyah said that the blood, property, and the wife of the kafir is halal for the believer. Did he say anything along those lines? Or did anyone else say something like that? Yeah, right. So there's a quote. I do quote it in a particular thing, but I mean, I can bring it up, but I don't want to just misquote it. But there's a quote where he's he's speaking about Dar al-Harb, uh, sorry, Dar al-Kufar. So he's saying the, that there is an ijma. He's claiming an ijma of, uh, that there is a consensus that, um, that, that, that the property or the person from Dar al, uh, from Dar al Kufar, like if a Muslim, like let's say, because there's a question that let's say a Muslim snuck into Dar al Kufar and they took something, like let's say they went there and robbed a house and came back, or they took somebody captive. Um, he's arguing that they, he's not arguing, he's stating that there's a consensus that that is then halal, um, which is, I, I don't believe that to be the case, but I'll have to bring the exact wording up. But you're right. I think it's been maybe a few years. I did 
cite something. I can maybe try and just bring it up whilst we're speaking. But hmm. well, what were your? What did you want to say about that? Well, I thought it was a shocking statement by Ibn Taymiyyah, and I know that some people consider him to be an extremist. He, for, for example, advocated the killing of Muslim converts, and I was shocked for, uh, when I heard that because Allah says in Al Quran, whoever kills a believer intentionally, for them the recompense is hell. So how could he go on and say things like that? And now the whole doctrine of jihad, you see, in in uh, in Islam, we have uh, two types of jihad, and the jihad uh, akbar and uh, the lesser jihad. The greater jihad is the struggle against nafs, uh, the struggle for excellence, to, the struggle for being a better Muslim. Yes, this is a very uh, important kind of jihad. The lesser jihad is the military jihad, but this military jihad only takes place in self-defense. Al-Quran does not give any authority to wage aggressive jihad or offensive jihad or jihad al-Talab. That is a purely invention and I would say a corruption of the teaching of the Quran on the concept of jihad. By the way, being on the subject, I could mention a paper written by Niaz A. Shah, that's N-I-A-Z, A uh, A, uh, dot Shah, that's A-S-H-A-H, and it is published by the European Journal of International Law, and it is on the doctrine of defensive and offensive jihad. I think this fellow does an excellent analysis, barring a few uh, weaknesses or missteps in his analysis, I think he's got 98% of it uh, right on the mark, so I would recommend this uh, for the readers, uh, they can find a more comprehensive Offensive treatment of the difference between, uh, you know, offensive and defensive jihad, than I have so far, uh, I feel, been able to to provide. But my basic position is that uh, no, the Quran does not uh, allow any form of aggression. I personally believe that all the wars, and there were many battles that the Prophet, peace be on him, waged in his lifetime, that all of them were defensive in nature. I don't believe that any of them amounted to to aggressive jihad. So. Yeah. But with the, with the doctrine of abrogation, the some of the ulama have um, uh, justified aggressing against uh, non-Muslims with very dire consequences for the Muslims themselves, not just the non-Muslims. Let me give you the example of the ill treatment of foreign tra- uh, foreigners by the Abbasids. Uh, we mentioned this earlier in our private. Uh, I mean, a talk before we went live. The Mongol, there were 500 Mongol tra- traders that were slaughtered by Haverism Shah. And uh, then there were three ambassadors dispatched by Genghis Khan to ask for justice for the killers of these traders. And the ambassadors were also slaughtered by uh, these uh, Haverism Shah. And that triggered a massive retaliation. Uh, by Genghis Khan and the Mongols, and basically brought the Abbasid dynasty to its knees. It uh, triggered rivers of blood in Baghdad and it basically destroyed the Abbasid dynasty. So this was partly the result, I think, of this kind of thinking, at, uh, adopting a kind of exclusive understanding of Islam, the Darul Kufr versus the Darul Islam, and treating foreigners in, con- uh, in, uh, in defiance of the Quran as, uh, you know, worthless enemies that can be, uh, you know, uh, slaughtered at will and their property can be basically stolen and, and uh, appropriated. So, as I mentioned also earlier in our discussion, World War One was still started by a mere murder of I shouldn't say mere murder, uh, by the murder of, uh, you know, the Archduke of Sarajevo and his yeah. wife. And World War I broke out as a result of the killing of two people. And 20 million people died in that conflict. How many people died in Genghis Khan retaliation against the Abbasid Empire as a result of the really terrible treatment by the uh, uh, leaders of uh, the dynasty at the time, uh, we, where, where they slaughtered 500 uh, Mongol traders and also they slaughtered the uh, three ambassadors that were dispatched by Genghis Khan to ask for justice. So this kind of aggressive thinking, I think, is very dangerous. And now we see it even in the contemporary age. People like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, uh, you know, cutting off people's heads on YouTube and stuff like that. What kind of image does it give to Islam, to us, to Muslims, to, to us? 
for us Muslims. Is it consistent with the teaching of the Quran? And then we have example of Saddam Hussein who attacks two countries, aggresses against Kuwait and aggresses against Iran, and the result is the same. The result basically is the second sacking of Baghdad by the Allies in 2003. We read in the Quran that you, we will never find a change in the Sunnah of Allah, and we can see confirmation of that every day practically in what we see around us. So please help me out, brother, if I'm missing something. But this kind of thinking is, I think, very dangerous that aggressive jih or offensive jihad is justified and that the world is made up of this uh, Darul uh, Islam and the Darul Kufr. And don't forget uh, Samuel Huntington's uh, you know, thesis of the clash of civilization is providing a kind of justification for the so-called war on terror, where the Muslims are the victims. So, Yeah, no, I... I, I, I... These kind of things, I've got a quote here, by the way, this isn't the, the quote that I think I quoted before, but it's kind of saying the same thing. This is just, uh, it's come up in a kind of paper where this person is speaking about Dar al-Harb and Dar al-Islam and, and Dar al-Kufar, and he's highlighting what Ibn uh, Uthaymin has to say as well on the issue, and then he goes to Ibn Taymiyyah, and he highlights that uh, Ibn Taymiyyah states that the kuffar la yamlikuna amwalahum shar'iyan uh what, and then he he he's saying that ibn taymiyyah argues that non-muslims don't actually have any property or a right to any property so he quotes him here allahu a'lam maybe people want to check this quote up if they want to kind of type in the words and search it later on um and he says that let 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 me get the quote here so um uh, wait there here he says qala wa amma al kuffar falam ya'dhin Allah lahum fi akli shay'in so Allah has not permitted for the kuffar to eat anything wala ahalla lahum shay'an and has not made anything halal for them wala afa anhum an shay'in ya'kuluna and neither has he forgiven them or made permissible anything they eat bal qal ya ayu an nas kulu mimma fi al ardi halalan tayyiban rather Allah has said oh people eat from what is of the earth halal and tayyib so Allah conditioned or stipulated that what they eat is halal and so that is which Allah has granted permission to eat uh, and legislated and that is and he has only legislated except for the believers so he only grants them permission to eat uh, or to have things if they are believers in him. Therefore, according to the Sharia, ah, their wealth is not legitimately theirs. Because according to the Sharia, ah, having possession is that which the Sharia ah allows you to have tasarruf, which is um, ownership of. And you can transact with. Then he, he goes on to say, And so Muslims, if they conquer any of their wealth, So he's saying, so if Muslims take it, they, and then he goes on to quote more. But that's a quote, even though he's ending the discussion with ghanaim, uh, which is a, a different discussion. It's more about war and the booty from war. But uh, <coughs> the beginning of the discussion is that they are not entitled to their wealth, which um, it ties in, I guess, to the quote, because if they don't legitimately own it, uh, the question was if somebody kind of snuck in and took something, by, then he could just own it. And which I said that, my point, purpose of saying this, and I'm not saying this to, you see, and, and I think it's important to highlight, this is not, you know, okay, like in the past, I, I, sometimes when, when I've done my things and I've got, you know, I've started jokes about certain things and I've made a few jokes as well and people have got offended. And I get that. And I've done that in the past, you know, I've been kind of provocative. But it's important to highlight that, look, with a, with a sense of maturity and sensibility, that, look, these things, I get it, these things are not to degrade or diss a person per se. This is not a witch hunt or a manhunt. 
you know, I've actually highlighted that Ibn Taymiyyah, to be fair, his thought on Maslaha is actually incredibly impressive. Um, it's, imp it's, it's almost like he has many different personalities and his, his Maslaha personality is like, wow, he's like so thinking ahead of his time. He's like saying, oh, women, uh, you know, they... They don't need to. Um, they don't need to be pure if they want to be in around the Kaaba. Or oh, he's ahead of his time trying to think of maslaha for talaq. He's ahead of his time trying to think of certain things. Uh, it's not a manhunt. It's just trying to highlight that look, Islam. If there are problems with a certain way of thinking, if there are problems with something, nobody's perfect. You see, in Islam, as Imam Malik said, he said it's just. You've got, he, he said that if you're speaking about an insan, he said, Illa sahib had al qabr. He pointed to the Prophet's grave and he said, with the exception of the person who resides here, the Prophet, he said, in Islam, we question everybody. You know, we, yukhad min qawlihi wa yurad. And so, if this statement <coughs> is belittling and denigrating, if people are using it, like you, you mentioned, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi or other people are using these kind of references as uh, the Saudi Sheikh Adil al-Kalbani said he said ISIS are using Salafi he said they are a product of Salafis this was the Sheikh from Saudi Arabia he said we can't deny that they were a product from here they're not it doesn't mean every Salafi is an ISIS but he was saying almost every <coughs> ISIS member was a Salafi almost. so there is a you know, we're not saying it the other way around. We're trying to say, he said they are using Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab's material. They are using, and now one may argue they're misusing, and that's a different discussion. But okay, so, yeah, just to highlight that, that look, don't feel, um, I get it, people love their tradition. Somebody could criticize, let's say, I'm not putting them in the same level, but let's say somebody could criticize Imam Malik. And say, look, Imam Malik said this, and I could be, a, I'm a huge fan, let's say, of Imam Malik, and I could get all defensive. Um, and fine, you know, that's a human reaction, but it's not, an, it's not the real reaction. The real reaction is to understand that no human being, uh, no, and as, as Imam Malik teaching himself, with the exception, we don't question, he said that in Islam, we question every single individual, he said, with the exception of the Prophet. So, yeah, so it's it's an honor for the deen, really. But wow, it's uh, it's we've really covered so many things. It's been so <laughs> wonderful uh, having you on here, Professor. We can uh, uh, there's so much to discuss, and I feel we've got to get you on again, <laughs> inshallah. Inshallah. I want to before we wrap up. I, uh, if people want to, where can people find you, and how can people reach out to you? Uh, uh, and anything you advise they should be checking up or researching? You... Yeah, thank you. Um, well, they can find me on Clubhouse. I'm active there almost every day in the uh, Muslim Reverse Room, also in the Progressive Muslims Room, also in the, and some other rooms as well. I can also be reached. Uh, you can write a comment on one of my uh, YouTube videos. Uh, you can get in touch with me that way. I believe my emails are included in my portfolio, my uh, you know uh, CV on academia. So there, there are different ways of reaching me. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I reduced my profile part, partly because I was getting getting a lot of spam mm -hmm. so uh, how do I put this uh, one of my emails is elterabesi at hotmail.com they could write to me on that address sure. I have two other emails but perhaps one may be enough for now mm. yeah. so yeah there are different ways of reaching me and uh, yeah I also want to thank you for having me on you're always uh, I always say to my friends you will never get bored listening to brother uh, Mufti Abu Laid because he's very entertaining in addition uh -huh. to uh -huh. It's an honor having you on, honestly. Yeah. I really love this conversation. And I feel that, wallahi, these kind of conversations, what's important about them is it's, it's so important, even more important than the conversation, is to show that people don't have to be symmetrical in, in conceptually. People, and, and like how you, you've very eloquently shown today, they don't even sometimes... Have, they can be a work in progress 
you know, like we were discussing today and you say, well, actually, you know, I'm still kind of figuring this out. And you say, well, actually, you know, it goes to that reflects a genuine sincerity and and the hallmark of intelligence that you can entertain a thought, even if you don't accept it, you can be like, well, hmm. and people can do it with respect and love and they actually enjoy it. And they think, wow, you know, this is a really enjoyable conversation. I, I, time well spent. And we need so much more of this. I will just uh, see if there's any f few comments and we'll wrap this up because I know it's you've got a busy schedule. It must be <laughs> getting very late over there uh, or into into the day, into the working day. So, guys, I can see uh, somebody had sent a message about wanting, what's that, about an hour to speak? Uh, right, if you want to, if you want to come on live, somebody said about coming on live. Uh, if it's, uh, and they said about just, no, just having a casual conversation, then what, uh, Mikaelo, what you can do is on, first of all, if it's, uh, if it's just coming on every week on Wednesdays, I have my meeting with Malm, uh, which you can come on. And that is, uh, it takes, I, I take people on. Obviously, I have a, a discussion and a lesson first on Quranic guidance and, and some other things. And then I do take live callers. If it's something like an hour, no, it's not <laughs> an hour per guest. It's not like that. If you want that, you're more than welcome to head over to Patreon and you can just book yourself in for a consultation. I have... Uh, my perspective sessions are actually an hour long, so that but they're just private. They're not kind of um, publicized in that sense. All right, let me just take a look. Um, yep, there's people, by the way, a lot of praise, and of course, uh, do uh, that's absolutely um, you know a must. There must be so a lot of praise coming out to to you as well, Professor. Somebody saying uh, Mufti Hindi. Shuddh Hindi. Abhi kis prakar ka prashan hai, bhai? <laughs> they go, do I speak Shuddh Hindi? Uh, Hindi bolte hain, yaar, Urdu bolte hain. We speak, uh, it's all awesome. Languages of the world, we love them all. And yes, of course. People, much love to you all. Um, have an incredible day wherever you are. And do remember, honestly, I can't emphasize this enough that remember that this faith, if it is amazing to have deep, intricate conversations with, with people and to benefit from them and to, to delve into this stuff at a deep end, it is amazing. But remember that Deen, if it's, it must, by its definition, it must be making you a better human being. If the Deen is making you angry, uh very kind of like tense it's making you awkward it's making you uh you know say bad things to people something the breaks need to go on okay this is not this is not allah this is not his messenger the deen must by its definition see the sun it provides light by its existence the deen must be amplifying compassion, love, and and just ihsan into the world from you. So may Allah make that happen. Once again, man lam yashkurin nas, lam yashkurin la, whosoever is not grateful to people, not grateful to God. So, Ustad, Professor, once again, I'm deeply grateful uh, for you extending your time with us today. It's been wonderful, really, a lot of time, a lot of precious thought. Uh, I love it. I think, you know, the fact that even just the start going straight into all the philosophy and and the books that you've authored, this is just so mesmerizing. So may God bless you and bless everybody to aspire to to work towards the faith in such a way. Take very good care, all of you and Professor. Wassalamu alaikum alaykum wa khuda hafiz. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. And of course, same to you, Brother Mufti Life. May Allah give you strength and increase us all in knowledge and wisdom and enable us to continue our struggle fi sabilillah. And hopefully we can uh, help to unite the Muslim Ummah as so many brothers and sisters are trying to do. And we can do it, I think, in the best way to do it would be to unite again uh, on our common, uh, uh, you know, coming together on the base of the Quran, which is the one book that we have from the one God. Not to say that we want to reject uh, additional sources, 
resources that may be helpful, but I hope that we can accomplish this together. So inshallah, we, we can look forward to a better time in the future. Thank you once again, Mufti, uh, for having me on, online and having an excellent discussion. And I have also uh, tremendously enjoyed this talk and I wish all your viewers also the best and may Allah bless you all and all your families. Thank you very much. As